the ascent of denali by hudson stuck this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by phil Schempf. the ascent of denali by hudson stuck preface forefront in this book because forefront in the author's heart and desire must stand a plea for the restoration to the greatest mountain in north america of its immemorial native name if there be any prestige or authority in such matter from the accomplishment of a first complete ascent if there be any virtue if there be any praise the author values it chiefly as it may give weight to this plea it is now little more than seventeen years ago that a prospector penetrated from the south into the neighborhood of this mountain guessed its height with remarkable accuracy at twenty thousand feet and ignorant of any name that it already bore placed upon it the name of the republican candidate for president of the united states at the approaching election william mckinley no voice was raised in protest for the alaskan indian is inarticulate and such white men as knew the old name were absorbed in the search for gold some years later an officer of the united states army upon a reconnaissance survey into the land passed around the companion peak and alike ignorant or careless of any native name put upon it the name of an ohio politician at that time prominent in the councils of the nation joseph foraker so there they stand upon the maps side by side the two greatest peaks of the alaskan range mount mckinley and mount foraker and there they should stand no longer since if there be right and reason in these matters they should not have been placed there at all to the relatively large indian population of those wide regions of the interior of alaska from which the mountains are visible they have always borne indian names the natives of the middle yukon of the lower three hundred miles of the tanana and its tributaries of the upper kuskokwim have always called these mountains den ali and den ali's wife either precisely as here written or with a dialectical difference in pronunciation so slight as to be negligible it is true that the little handful of natives on the shusitna river who never approach nearer than a hundred miles to the mountain have another name for it they call it Trilieka which in their wholly different language has the same signification it is probably true of every great mountain that it bears diverse native names as one tribe or another on this side or on that of its mighty bulk speaks of it but the area in which and the people by whom this mountain is known as denali preponderate so greatly as to leave no question which native name it should bear the bold front of the mountain is so placed on the returning curve of the alaska range that from the interior its snows are visible far and wide over many thousands of square miles and the indians of the tanana and of the yukon as well as of the kuskokwim hunt the caribou well up on its foothills its southern slopes are stern and forbidding through depth of snow and violence of glacial stream and are devoid of game its slopes toward the interior of the country are mild and amean with light snowfall and game in abundance should the reader ever be privileged as the author was a few years ago to stand on the frozen surface of lake michumina and see these mountains revealed as the clouds of a passing snowstorm swept away he would be overwhelmed by the majesty of the scene and at the same time deeply moved with the appropriateness of the simple native names for simplicity is always a quality of true majesty perhaps nowhere else in the world is so abrupt and great an uplift from so low a base the marshes and forests of the upper kuskokwim from which these mountains rise cannot be more than one thousand five hundred feet above the sea the rough approximation by the author's aneroid in the journey from the tanana to the kuskokwim would indicate a still lower level would make this wide plain little more than one thousand feet high and they rise sheer the tremendous cliffs of them apparently unbroken soaring superbly to more than twenty thousand and seventeen thousand feet respectively denali the great one and denali's wife and the little peaks in between the natives call the children it was on that occasion standing spellbound at the sublimity of the scene 
that the author resolved that if it were in his power he would restore these ancient mountains to the ancient people among whom they rear their heads savages they are if the reader please since savage means simply a forest dweller and the author is glad himself to be a savage a great part of every year but yet as savages entitled to name their own rivers their own lakes their own mountains after all these terms savage heathen pagan mean alike simply country people and point to some old-time superciliousness of the city-bred now confined one hopes to such localities as Whitechapel and the Bowery. There is, to the author's mind, a certain ruthless arrogance that grows more offensive to him as the years pass by, in the temper that comes to a new land and contemptuously ignores the native names of conspicuous natural objects, almost always appropriate and significant, and overlays them with names that are, commonly, neither the one nor the other the learned societies of the world the geographical societies the ethnological societies have set their faces against this practice these many years past and to them the writer confidently appeals this preface must bear a grateful acknowledgment to the most distinguished of alaskans the man who knows more of alaska than any other human being peter trimble Rowe, seventeen years bishop of that immense territory for the cordial assent which he gave to the proposed expedition and the leave of absence which rendered it possible one more in a long list of kindnesses which have rendered happy an association of nearly ten years nor can better place be found for a tribute of gratitude to those who were of the little party to mr harry p karstens strong competent and resourceful the real leader of the expedition in the face of difficulty and danger to mr robert g tatum who took his share and more than his share of all toil and hardship and was a most valuable colleague to walter harper indian bred until his sixteenth year and up to that time trained in not much else than henry of navarre's training to shoot straight to speak the truth to do with little food and less sleep though equal to an abundance of both on occasion who joyed in the heights as a mountain sheep or a chamois and whose sturdy limbs and broad shoulders were never weary or unwilling to all of these there is a heartfelt affection and deep obligation nor must johnny be forgotten the indian boy who faithfully kept the base camp during a long vigil and killed game to feed the dogs and denied himself unasked that others might have pleasure as the story will tell and the name of esaias the indian boy who accompanied us to the base camp and then returned with the superfluous dogs must be mentioned with commendation for fidelity and thanks for service acknowledgment is also made to many friends and colleagues at the mission stations in the interior who knew of the purpose and furthered it greatly and held their tongues so no premature screaming brute of it got into the alaskan newspapers to the rev c e bedicher jr particularly and most warmly the author would add perhaps quite unnecessarily yet lest any should mistake a final personal note he is no professed explorer or climber or scientist but a missionary and of these matters an amateur only the vivid recollection of a back bent down with burdens and lungs at the limit of their function makes him hesitate to describe this enterprise as recreation it was the most laborious undertaking with which he was ever connected yet it was done for the pleasure of doing it and the pleasure far outweighed the pain but he is concerned much more with men than mountains and would say since out of the fullness of the heart the mouth speaketh that his especial and growing concern these ten years past is with the native people of alaska a gentle and kindly race now threatened with a wanton and senseless extermination and sadly in need of generous champions if that threat is to be averted end of the preface chapter one of the ascent of denali this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Phil Schempf. The Ascent of Denali by Hudson Stuck. Chapter 1. Preparation and Approach. The enterprise which this volume describes was a cherished purpose through a number of years. In the exercise of his duties as Archdeacon of the Yukon, the author has traveled throughout the interior of Alaska, both winter and summer, almost continuously since 1904. Again and again, now from one distant elevation and now from another, the splendid vision of the greatest mountain in North America has spread before his eyes and left him each time with a keener longing to enter its mysterious fastnesses and scale its lofty peaks. Seven years ago, writing in the spirit of missions of a view of the mountain from Pedro Dome in the neighborhood of Fairbanks, he said, I would rather climb that mountain than discover the richest gold mine in Alaska. Indeed, when first he went to Alaska, it was part of the attraction which the country held for him that it contained an unclimbed mountain of the first class. Scoffell and Skidaw and Helvelin had given him his first boyish interest in climbing. The Colorado and Canadian Rockies had claimed one holiday after another of maturer years. But the summit of Rainier had been the greatest height he had ever reached. When he went to Alaska, he carried with him all the hypsometrical instruments that were used in the ascent, as well as his personal climbing equipment. There was no definite likelihood that the opportunity would come to him of attempting the ascent, but he wished to be prepared with instruments of adequate scale in case the opportunity should come, and Hicks of London made them nine years ago. Members of the Party Long ago also he had picked out Mr. Harry P. Karstens of Fairbanks as the one colleague with whom he would be willing to make the attempt. Mr. Karstens had gone to the Klondike in his seventeenth year, during the wild stampede to those diggings, paying the expenses of the trip by packing over the Chilkoot Pass, and had been engaged in pioneering and in travel of an arduous and adventurous kind ever since. He had mined in the Klondike, and in the Seventy Mile, hence his sobriquet of the Seventy Mile Kid. It was he and his partner, McGonagall, who broke the first trail from Fairbanks to Valdez, and for two years of difficulty and danger, dogs and men alike starving sometimes, brought the mail regularly through. When the stampede to the Kantishna took place, and the government was dilatory about instituting a mail service for the three thousand men in the camp, Karstens and his partner organized and maintained a private mail service of their own. He had freighted with dogs from the Yukon to the Iditarod, had run motor boats on the Yukon and the Tanana. For more than a year he had been a guide to Mr. Charles Sheldon, the well-known naturalist and hunter in the region around the foothills of Denali. With the full vigor of maturity, with all this accumulated experience and the resourcefulness and self-reliance which such experience brings, he had yet an almost juvenile keenness for further adventure, which made him admirably suited to this undertaking. Mr. Robert G. Tatum of Tennessee, just twenty-one years old, a postulant for holy orders, stationed at the mission at Nanana, had been employed all the winter in a determined attempt to get supplies freighted over the ice by natives and their dog teams to two women missionaries, a nurse and a teacher at the Tanana Crossing. The steamboat had cached the supplies at a point about 100 miles below the mission the previous summer, unable to proceed any farther. The upper Tanana is a dangerous and difficult river alike for navigation and for ice travel, and Tatum's efforts were made desperate by the knowledge that the women were reduced to a diet of straight rabbits without even salt. The famine relieved, he had returned to Nenana. The summer before, he had worked on a survey party, and had thus some knowledge of the use of instruments. By undertaking the entire cooking for the expedition, he was most useful and helpful, and his consistent courtesy and considerateness made him a very pleasant comrade. Of the half-breed boy, Walter Harper, the author's attendant and interpreter, dog driver in the winter, and boat engineer in the summer for three years previous, no more need be said than that he ran Karsten's close in strength, pluck, and endurance. Of the best that the mixed blood can produce, twenty-one years old and six feet tall, he took gleefully to high mountaineering, 
while his kindness and invincible amiability endeared him to every member of the party the men were thus all volunteers experienced in snow and ice though not in high mountain work but the nature of snow and ice is not radically changed by lifting them ten or fifteen or even twenty thousand feet up in the air a volunteer expedition was the only one within the resources of the writer and even that strained them the cost of food supplies the equipment and the incidental expenses was not far short of a thousand dollars a mere fraction of the cost of previous expeditions it is true but a matter of long scraping together for a missionary yet if there had been unlimited funds at his disposal and the financial aspect of the affair is alluded to only that this may be said it would have been impossible to assemble a more desirable party mention of two indian boys of fourteen or fifteen who were of great help to us must not be omitted they were picked out from the elder boys of the school at ninana all of whom were most eager to go and were good specimens of mission-bred native youths johnny was with the expedition from start to finish keeping the base camp while the rest of the party was above esaias was with us as far as the base camp and then went back to ninana with one of the dog teams methods of approach the resolution to attempt the ascent of denali was reached a year and a half before it was put into execution so much time was necessary for preparation almost any alaskan enterprise that calls for supplies or equipment from the outside must be entered upon at least a year in advance the plan followed had been adopted long before as the only wise one that the supplies to be used upon the ascent be carried by water as near to the base of the mountain as could be reached and cached there in the summer and that the climbing party go in with dog teams as near the first march as practicable strangely enough of all the expeditions that have essayed this ascent the first that of judge wickersham in nineteen o three and the last ten years later are the only ones that have approached their task in this natural and easy way the others have all burdened themselves with the great and unnecessary difficulties of the southern slopes of the range it was proposed to use the mission launch pelican which had travelled close to twenty thousand miles on the yukon and its tributaries in the six seasons she had been in commission to transport the supplies up the kantishna and bearpaw rivers to the head of navigation of the latter when her cruise of nineteen twelve was complete but a serious mishap to the launch which it was impossible to repair in alaska brought her activities for that season to a sudden end so mr karstens came down from fairbanks with his launch and a poling boat loaded with food staples and pushing the poling boat ahead successfully ascended the rivers and carefully cached the stuff some fifty miles from the base of the mountain it was done in a week or less equipment unfortunately the equipment and supplies ordered from the outside did not arrive in time to go in with the bulk of the stuff although ordered in february they arrived at tanana only late in september just in time to catch the last boat up to nanana and only half that had been ordered came at all one of the two cases has not been traced to this day moreover it was not until late the next february when actually about to proceed on the expedition that the writer was able to learn what items had come and what had not such are the difficulties of any undertaking in alaska despite all precautions that foresight may dictate the silk tents which had not come had to be made in fairbanks the ice axes sent were ridiculous gold-painted toys with detachable heads and broomstick handles more like dwarf halberds than ice axes and at least two workmanlike axes were indispensable so the head of an axe was sawn to the pattern of the writers out of a piece of tool steel and a substantial hickory handle and an iron shank fitted to it at the machine shop in fairbanks it served excellently well while the points of the fancy axes from new york splintered the first time they were used climbing irons or crampons were also to make no new york dealer being able to supply them one great difficulty was the matter of footwear heavy regulation nailed alpine boots were sent all too small to be worn with even a couple pairs of socks and therefore quite useless 
indeed at that time there was no house in new york or so far as the writer knows in the united states where the standard alpine equipment could be procured as a result of the dissatisfaction of this expedition with the material sent one house in new york now carries in stock a good assortment of such things of standard pattern and quality fairbanks was ransacked for boots of any kind in which three or four pairs of socks could be worn alaska is a country of big men accustomed to the natural spread of the foot which a moccasin permits but we could not find boots to our need save rubber snow packs and we bought half a dozen pairs of them number twelve and had leather soles fastened under them and nailed four pairs of alpine boots at eleven dollars a pair equals forty four dollars six pairs of snow packs at five dollars equals thirty dollars leather soles for them at three dollars equals eighteen dollars which totaled ninety two dollars entirely wasted we found that moccasins were the only practicable footgear and we had to put five pairs of socks within them before we were done but we did not know that at the time and had no means of discovering it all these matters were put in hand under karsten's direction while the writer only just arrived in fairbanks from fort yukon and tanana made a flying trip to the new mission at tanana crossing two hundred and fifty miles above fairbanks with walter and the dog team and most of them were finished by the time we returned a multitude of small details kept us several days more in fairbanks so that nearly the middle of march had arrived before we were ready to make our start to the mountain two weeks later than we had planned supplies karstens having joined us we went down to the mission at ninana seventy-five miles in a couple of days and there two more days were spent overhauling and repacking the stuff that had come from the outside in the way of food we had imported only herbs worst seventy-two four-ounce packages milk chocolate twenty pounds compressed china tea in tablets a most excellent tea with a very low percentage of tannin five pounds a specially selected grade of smyrna figs ten pounds and sugared almonds ten pounds about seventy pounds weight all scrupulously reserved for the high mountain work for trail equipment we had one eight by ten silk tent used for two previous winters three small circular tents of the same material made in fairbanks for the high work a yukon stove and the usual complement of pots and pans and dishes including two admirable large aluminum pots for melting snow used a number of years with great satisfaction a primus stove borrowed from the pelican's galley was taken along for the high work the bedding was mainly of down quilts which are superseding fur robes and blankets for winter use because of their lightness and warmth and the small compass into which they may be compressed two pairs of camel's hair blankets and one sleeping bag lined with down and camel's hair cloth were taken and karstens brought a great wolf robe weighing twenty-five pounds of which we were glad enough later on start another team was obtained at the mission and mr r g tatum and the two boys johnny and esaias joined the company which thus increased to six persons two sleds and fourteen dogs set out from ninana across country to the kantishna on st patrick's day travelling was over the beaten trail to the kantishna gold camp one of the smallest of alaskan camps supporting about thirty men in 1906 there was a wild stampede to this region and two or three thousand people went in chiefly from the fairbanks district town after town was built diamond city glacier city bearpaw city roosevelt mckinley city all with elaborate saloons and gambling places one at least equipped with electric lights but next summer the boom burst and all the thousands streamed out gold there was and is yet but in small quantities only the cities are mere collections of tumble-down huts amongst which the moose roam at will interior alaska has many such abandoned cities the few men now in the district have placer claims that yield a grub stake as a sure thing every summer and spend their winters chiefly in prospecting for quartz 
yet diamond city on the bear paw lay our cache of grub and that place some ninety miles from ninana and fifty miles from the base of denali was our present objective point it was bright clear weather and the trail was good for thirty miles our way lay across the wide flats of the tanana valley and this stage brought us to the banks of the ninana river another day of twenty-five miles of flats brought us to night's comfortable roadhouse and a ranch on the toklat a tributary of the kantishna the only roadhouse this trail can now support several times during these two days we had clear glimpses of the great mountain we were approaching and as we came out of the flat country the sheep hills a foothill range of denali much broken and deeply sculptured rose picturesquely before us our travel was now almost altogether on overflow ice upon the surface of swift streams that freeze solidly over their riffles and shallows and thus deny passage under the ice to the water of fountains and springs that never ceases flowing so it bursts forth and flows over the ice with a continually renewing surface of the smoothest texture carrying a mercurial barometer that one dare not entrust to a sled on one's back over such footing is a somewhat precarious proceeding but there was no alternative and many miles were thus passed up the toklat then up its clearwater fork then up its tributary myrtle creek to its head and so over a little divide and down willow creek we went and from that divide and the upper reaches of the last named creek had fine clear views not only of denali but of denali's wife as well now come much nearer and looming much larger the faces of the mountain but here it may be stated once for all that the view which this face of the mountain presents is never a satisfying one the same is true in even greater degree of the southern face all photographs agreeing with all travelers as to its tameness there is only one face of the denali group that is completely satisfying that is adequate to the full picturesque potentiality of a twenty thousand foot elevation the writer has seen no other view no other aspect of it comparable to that of the northwest face from lake Michumana. there the two mountains rise side by side sheer precipitous pointed rocks utterly inaccessible savage and superb the rounded shoulders the receding slopes and ridges of the other faces detract from the uplift and from the dignity but the northwestern face is stark one more run of much the same character as the previous day and we were at eureka in the heart of the kantishna country on friday twenty first to march being good friday we arrived there at noon and called it a day and spent the rest of it in the devotions of that august anniversary easter eve took us to glacier city and we lay there over the feast gathering three or four men who were operating a prospecting drill in that neighborhood for the first public worship ever conducted in the kantishna camp ten miles more brought us to diamond city on the bear paw where we found our cache of food in good condition save that the field mice despite all precautions had made access to the cereals and had eaten all the rolled oats amongst the kantishna miners who were most kindly and generous in their assistance we were able to pick up enough large-sized moccasins to serve the members of the party and we wore nothing else at all on the mountain timberline our immediate task now lay before us a ton and a half of supplies had to be hauled some fifty miles across country to the base of the mountain here the relaying began stuff being taken ahead and cached at some midway point then another load taken right through a day's march and then a return made to bring up the cache in this way we moved steadily though slowly across rolling country and upon the surface of a large lake to the mckinley fork of the kantishna which drains the muldrow glacier down that stream to its junction with the clearwater fork of the same and up that fork through its canyon to the last spruce timber on its banks and there we made a camp in an exceedingly pretty spot the creek ran open through a break in the ice in front of our tent the water oozels darted in and out under the ice singing most sweetly the willows all in bud perfumed the air and denali soared clear and brilliant far above the range right in front of us 
here at the timber line at an elevation of about two thousand feet was the pleasantest camp of the whole excursion during the five days stay here the stuff was brought up and carried forward and a quantity of dry wood was cut and advanced to a cache at the mouth of the creek by which we should reach the muldrow glacier it should be said that the short and easy route by which that glacier is reached was discovered after much scouting and climbing by mcgonagall and taylor in nineteen ten upon the occasion of the pioneer attempt upon the mountain of which more will be said by and by the men in the kantishna camp who took part in that attempt gave us all the information they possessed as they had done to the party that attempted the mountain last summer there has been no need to make reconnaissance for routes since these pioneers blazed the way there is no other practicable route than the one they discovered the two subsequent climbing parties have followed precisely in their footsteps up as far as the grand basin at sixteen thousand feet and it is the merest justice that such acknowledgment be made at our camp the clear water ran parallel with the range which rose like a great wall before us our approach was not directly toward denali but toward an opening in the range six or eight miles to the east of the great mountain this opening is known as cache creek passing the willow patch at its mouth where previous camps had been made we pushed up the creek some three miles more to its forks and there established our base camp on tenth april at about four thousand feet elevation a few scrubby willows struggled to grow in the creek bed but the hills that rose from one thousand five hundred to two thousand feet around us were bare of any vegetation save moss and were yet in the main covered with snow caribou signs were plentiful everywhere and we were no more than settled in camp when a herd appeared in sight game and its preparation our prime concern at this camp was the gathering and preserving of a sufficient meat supply for our subsistence on the mountain it was an easy task first karstens killed a caribou and then walter a mountain sheep then esaias happened into the midst of a herd of caribou as he climbed over a ridge and killed three that was all we needed then we went to work preparing the meat why should any one haul canned pemmican hundreds of miles into the greatest game country in the world we made our own pemmican of the choicest parts of this tender juicy meat and we never lost appetite for it or failed to enjoy and assimilate it a fifty-pound lard can three parts filled with water was set on the stove and kept supplied with joints of meat as a batch was cooked we took it out and put more into the same water removed the flesh from the bones and minced it then we melted a can of butter added pepper and salt to it and rolled a handful of the minced meat in the butter and molded it with the hands into a ball about as large as a baseball we made a couple hundred of such balls and froze them and they kept perfectly when all the boiling was done we put in the hocks of the animals and boiled down the liquor into five pounds of the thickest richest meat extract jelly adding the marrow from the bones with this pemmican and this extract of caribou a package of herbs worst and a cupful of rice we concocted every night the stew which was our main food in the higher regions the instruments here the instruments were overhauled the mercurial barometer reading by veneers to three places of decimals was set up and read and the two aneroids were adjusted to read with it these two aneroids perhaps deserve a word aneroid a was a three inch three circle instrument the invention of colonel watkins of the british army of rangefinder fame it seems strange that the advantage of the three circle aneroid is so little known in this country for its three concentric circles give such an open scale that although this particular instrument reads to twenty five thousand feet it is easy to read as small a difference as twenty feet on it it had been carried in the hind sack of the writer's sled for the past eight winters and constantly and satisfactorily used to determine the height of summits and passes upon the trails of the interior aneroid b was a six inch patent mountain aneroid another invention of the same military genius prompted by mr whimper's experiments with the aneroid barometer after his return from his classic climbs to the summits of the bolivian andes 
Colonel Watkins devised an instrument in which, by a threaded post and a thumb screw, the spring may be relaxed or brought into play at will, and the instrument is never in commission save when a reading is taken. Then a few turns of the thumb screw bring the spring to bear upon the box. Its walls expand until the pressure of the spring equals the pressure of the atmosphere. The reading is taken and the instrument thrown out of operation again. A most ingenious arrangement by which it was hoped to overcome some of the persistent faults of elastic chamber barometers. The writer had owned this instrument for the past ten years, but had never opportunity to test its usefulness until now. So, although it read no lower than about fifteen inches, he took it with him to observe its operation. Lastly, completing the hypsometrical equipment was a boiling point thermometer with its own lamp and case, reading to 165 degrees by tenths of a degree. Then there were the ice creepers or crampons to adjust to the moccasins. Terribly heavy, clumsy rat trap affairs they looked, but they served us well on the higher reaches of the mountain and are, if not indispensable, at least most valuable where hard snow or ice is to be climbed. The snowshoes also had to be rough locked by lashing a wedge shaped bar of hardwood underneath, just above the tread, and screwing cocks along the sides. Thus armed, they gave a sure footing on soft snow slopes, and were particularly useful in ascending the glacier. While thus occupied at the base camp, came an Indian, his wife and child, all the way from Lake Michumina perhaps one hundred miles journey to have the child baptized it was generally known amongst all the natives of the region that the enterprise was on foot and Machumana john hoping to meet us in the kantishna and missing us had followed our trail thus far it was interesting to speculate how much further he would have penetrated walter thought as far as the glacier but i think he would have followed us as far as the dogs could go or until food was quite exhausted meanwhile the relaying of the supplies and the wood to the base camp had gone on and the advancing of it to a cache at the pass by which we should gain the muldrow glacier on fifteenth april esaias and one of the teams were sent back to ninana almost all the stuff we should move was already at this cache and the need for two dog teams was over moreover the trails were rapidly breaking up and it was necessary for the boy to travel by night instead of by day on his return trip johnny and the other dog team were kept because we designed to use the dogs up to the head of the glacier and the boy to keep the base camp and tend the dogs when this was done until our return so we said good-bye to esaias and he took out the last word that was received from us in more than two months mcphee pass the photograph of the base camp shows a mountainous ridge stretching across much of the background. That ridge belongs to the outer wall of the Muldrow Glacier and indicates its general direction. Just beyond the picture, to the right, the ridge breaks down and the little valley in the middle distance sweeps around, becoming a steep, narrow gulch, and ends at the breach in the glacier wall this breach thus reached is the pass which the kantishna miners of the pioneer expedition discovered and named mcphee pass after a fairbank saloon keeper the name should stand there is no other pass by which the glacier can be reached certainly none at all above and probably no convenient one below unless this pass were used it would be necessary to make the long and difficult journey to the snout of the glacier some twenty-five miles farther to the east cross its rough terminal moraine and traverse all its lower stretch on the eleventh april karstens and i wound our way up the narrow steep defile for about three miles from the base camp and came to our first sight of the muldrow glacier some two thousand five hundred feet above camp and six thousand three hundred feet above the sea that day stands out in recollection as one of the notable days of the whole ascent there the glacier stretched away broad and level the road to the heart of the mountain and as our eyes traced its course our spirits leaped up that at last we were entered upon our real task one of us at least knew something of the dangers and difficulties its apparently smooth surface concealed yet to both of us it had an infinite attractiveness for it was the highway of our desire end of chapter one
Chapter Two of the Ascent of Denali by Hudson Stuck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Muldrow Glacier. Right opposite McPhee Pass, across the glacier, perhaps at this point half a mile wide, rises a bold pyramidal peak, twelve thousand or thirteen thousand feet high which we would like to name mount farthing in honor of the memory of a very noble gentlewoman who died at the mission at ninana three years ago unless unknown to us it already bears some other name walter and our two indian boys had been under her instruction at the base of this peak two branches of the glacier unite coming down in the same general direction and together draining the snows of the whole eastern face of the mountain the dividing wall between them almost up to their head and termination is one stupendous well-nigh vertical escarpment of ice-covered rock towering six thousand or seven thousand feet above the glacier floor the first of the very impressive features of the mountain the other wall of the glacier through a breach in which we reached its surface the right-hand wall as we journeyed up it consists of a series of inaccessible cliffs deeply seamed with snow gullies and crusted here and there with hanging glaciers the rock formation changing several times as one proceeds but maintaining an unbroken rampart now it is important to remember that these two ridges which make the walls of the muldrow glacier rise ultimately to the two summits of the mountain the right hand wall culminating in the north peak and the left hand wall in the south peak and the glacier lies between the walls all the way up and separates the summits with this qualification that midway in its course it is interrupted by a perpendicular ice fall of about four thousand feet by which its upper portion discharges into its lower it will help the reader to a comprehension of the ascent if this rough sketch be borne in mind the course of the glacier at the point at which we reached it is nearly northeast and southwest magnetic its surface is almost level and it is free of crevasses save at its sides for three or four miles above the pass it pursues its course without change of direction or much increase in grade then it takes a broad sweep toward the south and grows steep and much crevassed three miles farther up it takes another and more decided southerly bend receiving two steep but short tributaries from the northwest at an elevation of about ten thousand feet and finishing its lower course in another mile and a half at an elevation of about eleven thousand five hundred feet with an almost due north and south direction magnetic a week after our first sight of the glacier or on the eighteenth april we were camped at about the farthest point we had been able to see on that occasion just round the first bend our stuff had been freighted to the pass and cached there then in the usual method of our advance the camp had been moved forward beyond the cache on to the glacier a full day's march then the team worked backward bringing up the stuff to the new camp thus three could go ahead prospecting and staking out a trail for further advance while two worked with the dog team at the freighting crevasses for the glacier difficulties now confronted us in the fullest degree immediately above our tent the ice rose steeply a couple of hundred feet and at that level began to be most intricately crevassed it took several days to unravel the tangle of fissures and discover and prepare a trail that the dogs could haul the sleds along sometimes a bridge would be found over against one wall of the glacier and for the next we might have to go clear across to the other wall sometimes a block of ice jammed in the jaws of a crevasse would make a perfectly safe bridge sometimes we had nothing upon which to cross save hardened snow some of the gaps were narrow and some wide yawning chasms some of them were mere surface cracks and some gave hundreds of feet of deep blue ice with no bottom visible at all sometimes there was no natural bridge over a crevasse and then choosing the narrowest and shallowest place of it we made a bridge excavating blocks of hard snow with the shovels and building them up from a ledge below or projecting them on the cantilever principle one beyond the other from both sides 
many of these crevasses could be jumped across by an unencumbered man on his snowshoes that could not have been jumped with a pack and that the dogs could not cross at all as each section of trail was determined it was staked out with willow shoots hundreds of which had been brought up from below and in all this pioneering work and indeed thenceforward invariably the rope was conscientiously used every step of the way up the glacier was sounded by a long pole the man in the lead thrusting it deep into the snow while the two behind kept the rope always taut more than one pole slipped into a hidden crevasse and was lost when vigor of thrust was not matched by tenacity of grip more than once a man was jerked back just as the snow gave way beneath his feet the open crevasses were not the dangerous ones the whole glacier was criss-crossed by crevasses completely covered with snow in bright weather it was often possible to detect them by a slight depression in the surface or by a faint shadowy difference in tint but in the half-light of cloudy and misty weather these signs failed and there was no safety but in the ceaseless prodding of the pole the ice axe will not serve one cannot reach far enough forward with it for safety and the incessant stooping is an unnecessary added fatigue heavy hauling for the transportation of our wood and supplies beyond the first glacier camp the team of six dogs was cut into two teams of three each drawing a little yukon sled procured in the kantishna the large basket sled having been abandoned and in the movement forward when the trail to a convenient cache had been established two men roped together accompanied each sled one ahead of the dogs the other just behind the dogs at the gee pole this latter also had a hauling line looped about his breast so that men and dogs and sled made a unit it took the combined traction power of men and dogs to take the loads up the steep glacial ascents and it was very hard work once snowball the faithful team leader of four years past who has helped haul my sled nearly ten thousand miles broke through a snow bridge and the belly band parting slipped out of his collar and fell some twenty feet below to a ledge in a crevasse walter was let down and rescued the poor brute trembling but uninjured without the dogs we should have been much delayed and could hardly one judges have moved the wood forward at all the work on the glacier was the beginning of the ceaseless grind which the ascent of denali demands how intolerably hot it was on some of these days relaying the stuff up the glacier i shall never forget ascension day which occurred this year on the first may double feast as it was for saints philip and james fall on that day it was a day of toil and penance with a mercurial barometer and a heavy pack of instruments and cameras and films on my back and the rope over my shoulder bent double hauling at the sled i trudged along all day panting and sweating through four or five inches of newly fallen snow while the glare of the sun was terrific it seemed impossible that surrounded entirely by ice and snow with millions of tons of ice underfoot it could be so hot but we took the loads right through to the head of the glacier that day rising some four thousand feet in the course of five miles and cached them there on other days a smother of mist lay all over the glacier's surface with never a breath of wind and the air seemed warm and humid as in an atlantic coast city in july yet again starting early in the morning sometimes a zero temperature nipped toes and fingers and a keen wind cut like a knife sometimes it was bitterly cold in the mornings insufferably hot at noon and again bitterly cold toward night it was a pity we had no black bulb sun maximum thermometer amongst our instruments for one is sure its readings would have been of great interest it was a pity also that we had no means of making an attempt at measuring the rate of movement of this glacier a subject we often discussed the carriage of poles enough to set out rows of them across the glacier would have greatly increased our loads and the time required to transport them but it is certain that its rate of movement is very slow in general though faster at certain spots than at others and a reason for this judgment will be given later the fire on the glacier 
the midway cache between our first and last glacier camps was itself the scene of a camp we had not designed for on the day we were moving finally forward we were too fatigued to press on to the spot that had been selected at the head of the glacier and by common consent made a halt at the cache and set up the tent there this is mentioned because it had consequences if we had gone through that day and had established ourselves at the selected spot a disaster that befell us would in all probability not have happened for the next day instead of moving our camp forward we relayed some stuff and cached it where the camp would be made covering the cache with three small silk tents then we sat around a while and ate our luncheon and presently went down for another load imagine our surprise upon returning some hours later to see a column of smoke rising from our cache all sorts of wild speculations flew through the writer's mind as in the lead that day he first crested a serac that gave view of the cache had some mysterious climber come over from the other side of the mountain and built a fire on the glacier had he discovered our wood and our grub and perhaps starving kindled a fire of the one to cook the other was there really then some access to this face of the mountain from the south for it is fixed in the mind of the traveller in the north beyond eradication that smoke must mean man but ere we had gone much farther the truth dawned upon us that our cache was on fire and we left the dogs and the sleds and hurried to the spot something we were able to save but not much though we were in time to prevent the fire from spreading to our far hauled wood and the explanation was not far to seek after luncheon karstens and the writer had smoked their pipes and one or the other had thrown a careless match away that had fallen unextinguished upon the silk tents that covered the cache presently a little wind had fanned the smouldering fabric into flame which had eaten down into the pile of stuff below mostly in wooden cases all our sugar was gone all our powdered milk all our baking powder our prunes raisins and dried apples most of our tobacco a case of pilot bread a sack full of woolen socks and gloves another sack full of photographic films all were burned most fortunately the food provided especially for the high mountain work had not yet been taken to the cache and our pemmican herbswurst chocolate compressed tea and figs were safe but it was a great blow to us and involved considerable delay at a very unfortunate time we felt mortification at our carelessness as keenly as we felt regret at our loss the last thing a newcomer would dream of would be danger from fire on a glacier but we were not newcomers and we all knew how ever present that danger is more imminent in alaska in winter than in summer our carelessness had brought us nigh to the ruining of the whole expedition the loss of the films was especially unfortunate for we were thus reduced to walter's small camera with a common lens and the six or eight spools of film he had for it camping comfort the next day the final move of the main camp was made and we established ourselves in the cirque at the head of the muldrow glacier at an elevation of about eleven thousand five hundred feet more than halfway up the mountain after digging a level place in the glacier and setting up the tent a wall of snow blocks was built all round it and a little house of snow blocks a regular eskimo igloo was built near by to serve as a cache some details of our camping may be of interest the damp from the glacier ice had incommoded us at previous camps coming up through skins and bedding when the tent grew warm so at this camp we took further precaution the boxes in which our grub had been hauled were broken up and laid over the whole portion of the floor of the tent where our bed was over this wooden floor a canvas cover was laid and upon this the sun-dried hides of the caribou and mountain sheep we had killed were placed there was thus a dry bottom for our bedding and we were not much troubled thenceforward by the rising moisture although a camp upon the ice is naturally always a more or less sloppy place the hides were invaluable heavy as they were we carried them all the way up so soon as we were thus securely lodged elated when we thought of our advance but downcast when we recalled our losses we set ourselves to repair the damage of the fire so far as it was repairable 
walter and johnny must go all the way down to the base camp and bring up sled covers out of which to construct tents must hunt the baggage through for old socks and mitts and must draw upon what grub had been left for our return journey to the extreme limit it was safe to do so Karstens, accustomed to be clean-shaven had been troubled since our first glacier camp with an affection of the face which he attributed to ingrowing whiskers but when many hairs had been plucked out with the tweezers he was nothing bettered but rather grew worse and the inflammation spread to neck and temple it was more correctly attributed to an eczema or tetter caused by the glare of the sun so he was not loath to seclude himself for a few days in the tent while we set about the making of socks and mitts from the camel's hair lining of the sleeping bag walter's face was also very sore from the sun his lips in particular being swollen and blistered so painful did they become that i cut up lip covers of surgeon's plaster to protect them then the boys returned with the sorry gleanings of the base camp and the business of making two tents from the soiled and torn sled covers and darning worn-out socks and mittens was put in hand our camp looked like a sweatshop those days with its cross-legged tailormen and its litter of snippets in addition to the six by seven tent three feet six inches high in which we were to live when we left the glacier we made a small conical tent in which to read the instruments on the summit and all those days the sun shone in a clear sky amber glasses here since reference has just been made to the effect of the sun's glare on the face of one member of the party it may be in place to speak of the perfect eye protection which the amber snow glasses afforded us long experience with blue and smoke-coloured glasses upon the trail in spring had led us to expect much irritation of the eyes despite the use of snow glasses and we had plentifully provided ourselves with boracic acid and zinc sulphate for eye washes but the amber glasses with their yellow celluloid side pieces were not a mere palliative as all other glasses had been in our experience but a complete preventive of snow blindness no one of us had the slightest trouble with the eyes and the eye washes were never used it is hard for any save men compelled every spring to travel over the dazzling snows to realize what a great boon this newly discovered amber glass is there is no reason anywhere for any more snow blindness and there is no use anywhere for any more blue or smoked glasses the invention of the amber snow glass is an even greater blessing to the traveller in the north than the invention of the thermos bottle no test could be more severe than that which we put the glasses to we were now at the farthest point at which it was possible to use the dogs at our actual climbing base and the time had come for johnny and the dogs to go down to the base camp for good we should have liked to keep the boy so good-natured and amiable he was and so keen for further climbing but the dogs must be tended and the main food for them was yet to seek on the foothills with the rifle so on ninth may down they went tatum and the writer escorting them with the rope past the crevasses as far as the first glacier camp and then toiling slowly up the glacier again thankful that it was for the last time that was one of the sultriest and most sweltering days either of us ever remembered a moist heat of sun beating down through the vapour with never a breath of breeze a stifling stewing day that with the steep climb added completely exhausted and prostrated us the great ice fall it is important that the reader should be able to see in his mind's eye the situation of our camp at the head of the glacier because to do so is to grasp the simple orography of this face of the mountain and to understand the route of its ascent probably the only route by which it can be ascended standing beside the tent facing in the direction we have journeyed the great highway of the glacier comes to an abrupt end a cul-de-sac on the right hand the wall of the glacier towers up with enormous precipitous cliffs encrusted with hanging ice to the north peak of the mountain eight or nine thousand feet above us about at right angles to the end of the glacier and four thousand feet above it is another glacier which discharges by an almost perpendicular ice fall upon the floor of the glacier below 
the left-hand wall of the glacier described some pages back as a stupendous escarpment of ice-covered rock breaks rapidly down into a comparatively low ridge which sweeps to the right and closes the head of the glacier and then rises rapidly to the glacier above and still rises to form the left-hand wall of that glacier and finally the southern or higher peak of the mountain so the upper glacier separates the two great peaks of the mountain and discharges at right angles into the lower glacier and the walls of the lower glacier sweep around and rise to form the walls of the upper glacier and ultimately the summits of the mountain to reach the peaks one must first reach the upper glacier and the southern or left-hand wall of the lower glacier where it breaks down into the ridge that encloses the head of the glacier is the only possible means by which the upper basin may be reached this ridge then called by parker and brown the northeast ridge and we have kept that designation though with some doubt as to its correctness presented itself as the next stage in our climb last year's earthquake now just before leaving fairbanks we had received a copy of a magazine containing the account of the parker brown climb and in that narrative mr brown speaks of this northeast ridge as a steep but practicable snow slope and prints a photograph which shows it as such to our surprise when we first reached the head of the glacier the ridge offered no resemblance whatever to the description or the photograph the upper one-third of it was indeed as described but at that point there was a sudden sharp cleavage and all below was a jumbled mass of blocks of ice and rock in all manner of positions with here a pinnacle and there a great gap moreover the floor of the glacier at its head was strewn with enormous icebergs that we could not understand at all all at once the explanation came to us the earthquake the parker brown party had reported an earthquake which shook the whole base of the mountain on sixth july nineteen twelve two days after they had come down and as was learned later the seismographic instruments at washington recorded it as the most severe shock since the san francisco disturbance of nineteen o six there could be no doubt that the earthquake had disrupted this ridge the huge bergs all around us were not the normal discharge of hanging glaciers as we had at first wonderingly supposed they were the incrustation of ages maybe ripped off the rocks and hurled down from the ridge by this convulsion it was as though as soon as the parker brown party reached the foot of the mountain the ladder by which they had ascended and descended was broken up what a wonderful providential escape these three men parker brown and lavoy had they reached a spot within three or four hundred feet of the top of the mountain struggling gallantly against a blizzard but were compelled at last to beat a retreat again from their seventeen thousand foot camp they essayed it only to be enshrouded and defeated by dense mist they would have waited in their camp for fair weather had they been provided with food but their stomachs would not retain the canned pemmican they had carried laboriously aloft and they were compelled to give up the attempt and descend so down to the foot of the mountain they went and immediately they reached their base camp this awful earthquake shattered the ridge and showered down bergs on both the upper and lower glaciers had their food served they had certainly remained above and had they remained above their bodies would be there now even could they have escaped the avalanching icebergs they could never have descended that ridge after the earthquake they would either have been overwhelmed and crushed to death instantly or have perished by starvation one cannot conceive grander burial than that which lofty mountains bend and crack and shatter to make or a nobler tomb than the great upper basin of denali but life is sweet and all men are loath to leave it and certainly never men who cling to life had more cause to be thankful the difficulty of our task was very greatly increased that was plain at a glance this ridge that the pioneer climbers of nineteen ten went up at one march with climbing iron strapped beneath their moccasins carrying nothing but their flagpole that the parker brown party surmounted in a few days relaying their camp stuff and supplies was to occupy us for three weeks while we hewed a staircase three miles long in the shattered ice glacier movement 
it was the realization of the earthquake and of what it had done that convinced us that this muldrow glacier has a very slow rate of movement the great blocks of ice hurled down from above lay apparently just where they had fallen almost a year before at the points of sharp descent at the turns in its course at the points where tributary glaciers were received the movement is somewhat more rapid we saw some crevasses upon our descent that were not in existence when we went up but for the whole stretch of it we were satisfied that a very few feet a year would cover its movement no doubt all the glaciers on this side of the range are much more sluggish than on the other side where the great precipitation of snow takes place we told johnny to look for us in two weeks it was thirty-one days ere we rejoined him for now began the period of suspense of hope blasted anew nearly every morning the period of weary waiting for decent weather with the whole mountain and glacier enveloped in thick mist it was not possible to do anything up above and day after day this was the condition varied by high wind and heavy snow from the inexhaustible cisterns of the pacific ocean that vapor was distilled and ever it rose to these mountains and poured all over them until every valley every glacier every hollow was filled to overflowing there seemed sometimes to us no reason why the process should not go on forever the situation was not without its ludicrous side when one had the grace to see it here were four men who had already passed through the long alaskan winter and now when the rivers were breaking and the trees bursting into leaf the flowers spangling every hillside they were deliberately pushing themselves up into the winter still with the long expected summer but a day's march away the tedium of lying in that camp while snowstorm or fierce high wind forbade adventure upon the splintered ridge was not so great to the writer as to some of the other members of the expedition for there was always walter's education to be prosecuted and it had been prosecuted for three winters on the trail and three summers on the launch in a desultory but not altogether unsuccessful manner an hour or two spent in writing from dictation another hour or two in reading aloud a little geography and a little history and a little physics made the day pass busily a pupil is a great resource karstens was continually designing and redesigning a motor-boat in which one engine should satisfactorily operate twin screws tatum learned the thirty-nine articles by heart but naval architecture and even controversial divinity palled after a while the equipment and the supplies for the higher region were gone over again and again to see that all was properly packed and in due proportion the language of commerce talcum and glucose as one handled the packages and read and re-read the labels one was struck by the meagre english of merchandisers and the poor verbal resources of commerce generally a while ago business dealt hardly with the word proposition it was the universal noun everything that business touched however remotely was a proposition when last he was outside the writer heard the nicene creed described as a tough proposition the vice president of the united states as a cold-blooded proposition and missionaries in alaska generally as queer propositions now commerce has discovered and appropriated the word product and is working it for all it is worth the coffee in the can calls itself a product the compressed medicines from london direct you to dissolve one product in so much water the vacuum bottles inform you that since they are a glass product they will not guarantee themselves against breakage the tea tablets and the condensed pea soup affirm the purity of these products the powdered milk is a little more explicit and calls itself a food product one feels disposed to agree with humpty dumpty in through the looking-glass that when a word is worked as hard as this it ought to be paid extra one feels that product ought to be coming round on saturday night to collect its overtime the zwieback amuses one it is a west coast product and apparently product has not yet reached the west coast it does not so dignify itself but it urges one in great letters on every package to save the end seals they are valuable 
Walter finds that by gathering 1,200 of these seals, he would be entitled to a rolled gold watch absolutely free. This Zweibach was the whole stock of a Yukon grocer, purchased when the supply we ordered did not arrive. The writer was reminded of the time when he bought several two-pound packages of rolled oats at a little Yukon store, and discovered to his disgust that every package contained a china cup and saucer that must have weighed at least a pound. One can understand the poor Indian being thus deluded into the belief that he is getting his crockery for nothing, but it is hard to understand how the gift enterprise and premium package folly still survives amongst the white people, and Indians do not eat his wyback. What sort of people are they who will feverishly purchase and consume 1,200 packages of Zweibach in order to get a rolled gold watch for nothing? A sack of cornmeal takes one's eyes mainly by the enumeration of the formidable processes which the product inside has survived. It is announced proudly as de-germinated, granulated, double kiln dried, steam ground, but why, in the name of even an adulterous and adulterating generation, should rice be coated with talcum and glucose, as this sack unblushingly confesses? It is all very well to add, remove by washing. That is precisely what we shall be unable to do. It will take all the time and fuel we have to spare to melt snow for cooking, when one little primus stove serves for all purposes when we leave this camp there will be no more water for the toilet we shall have to cleanse our hands with snow and let our faces go the rice will enter the pot unwashed and will transfer its talcum and glucose to our intestines nor is this the case merely on exceptional mountain climbing expeditions it is the general rule during the winter throughout alaska it takes a long time and a great deal of snow and much wood to produce a pot of water on the winter trail that talcum and glucose abomination should be taken up by the pure food law authorities all the rice that comes to alaska is so labeled the stomachs and bowels of dogs and men in the country are doubtless gradually becoming coated with talcum and glucose sugar it was during this period of hope deferred that we began to be entirely without sugar. Perhaps by the ordinary man anywhere, certainly by the ordinary man in Alaska, where it is the rule to include as much sugar as flour in an outfit, deprivation of sugar is felt more keenly than deprivation of any other article of food. We watched the gradual dwindling of our little sack, replenished from the base camp with the few pounds we had reserved for our return journey, with sinking hearts it was kept solely for tea and coffee we put no more in the sourdough for hot cakes we ceased its use on our rice for breakfast we gave up all sweet messes tatum attempting a pudding without sugar putting vanilla and cinnamon and one knows not what other flavorings in it in the hope of disguising the absence of sweetness but no one could eat it and there was much jeering at the cook still it dwindled and dwindled two spoonfuls to a cup were reduced by common consent to one and still it went until at last the day came when there was no more our cocoa became useless we could not drink it without sugar our consumption of tea and coffee diminished there was little demand for the second cup and we began to long for sweet things we tried to make a palatable potation from some of our milk chocolate reserved for the higher work and labeled for eating only the label was accurate it made a miserable drink the milk taste entirely lacking the sweetness almost gone we speculated how our ancestors got on without sugar when it was a high-priced luxury brought painfully in small quantities from the orient and assured one another that it was not a necessary article of diet at last we all agreed to karsten's laconic advice forget it and we spoke of sugar no more when we got on the ridge the chocolate satisfied to some extent the craving for sweetness but we all missed the sugar sorely and continued to miss it to the end karsten's as much as anybody else our long detention here made us thankful for the large tent and the plentiful wood supply 
that wood had been hauled twenty miles and raised nearly ten thousand feet but it was worth while since it enabled us to weather out the weather here in warmth and comparative comfort the wood no more than served our need indeed we had begun to economize closely before we left this camp we were greatly interested and surprised at the intrusion of animal life into these regions totally devoid of any vegetation a rabbit followed us up the glacier to an elevation of ten thousand feet gnawing the bark from the willow shoots with which the trail was staked creeping round the crevasses and in one place at least leaping such a gap at ten thousand feet he turned back and descended leaving his tracks plain in the snow we speculated as to what possible object he could have had and decided that he was migrating from the valley below overstocked with rabbits as it was and had taken a wrong direction for his purpose unless the ambition for first ascents have reached the laporidae this seemed the only explanation at this camp at the head of the glacier we saw ptarmigan on several occasions and heard their unmistakable cry on several more and once we felt sure that a covey passed over the ridge above us and descended to the other glacier it was always in thick weather that these birds were noticed at the glacier head and we surmised that perhaps they had lost their way in the cloud but even this was not the greatest height at which bird life was encountered in the grand basin at sixteen thousand five hundred feet walter was certain that he heard the twittering of small birds familiar throughout the winter in alaska and this also was in the mist i have never known the boy make a mistake in such matters and it is not essentially improbable dr workman saw a pair of chuffs at twenty one thousand feet on nun Kun in the himalayas avalanches our situation on the glacier floor much of the time enveloped in dense mist was damp and cold and gloomy the cliffs around from time to time discharged their unstable snows in avalanches that threw clouds of snow almost across the wide glacier often we could see nothing and the noise of the avalanches without the sight of them was at times a little alarming but the most notable discharges were those from the great icefall and the more important of them were startling and really very grand sights a slight movement would begin along the side of the ice in one of the gullies of the rock a little trickling and rattling gathering to itself volume as it descended it started ice in other gullies and presently there was a roar from the whole face of the enormous hanging glacier and the floor upon which the precipitation descended trembled and shook with the impact of the discharge dense volumes of snow and ice dust rose in clouds thousands of feet high and slowly drifted down the glacier we had chosen our camping place to be out of harm's way and were really quite safe we never saw any large masses detach and by the time the ice reached the glacier floor it was all reduced to dust and small fragments one does not recall in the reading of mountaineering books any account of so lofty an icefall end of chapter two chapter three of the ascent of denali by hudson stuck this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf the northeast ridge some of the photographs we succeeded in getting will show better than any words the character of the ridge we had to climb to the upper basin by the lowest point of the ridge was that nearest our camp to reach its crest at that point some three hundred feet above the glacier was comparatively easy but when it was reached there stretched ahead of us miles and miles of ice blocks heaved in confusion resting at insecure angles poised some on their points some on their edges rising in this chaotic way some three thousand feet here one would have to hew steps up and over a pinnacle there one must descend again and cut around a great slab our wisest course was to seek to reach the crest of the ridge much further along beyond as much of this ice chaos as possible but it was three days before we could find a way of approach to the crest that did not take us under overhanging icebergs that threatened continually to fall upon our heads as the overhanging hill threatened christian in the pilgrim's progress at last we took straight up a steep gully 
half of it snow slope the upper half ice encrusted rock and hewed steps all the five hundred feet to the top here we were about a half a mile beyond the point at which we first attained the crest with that half mile of ice blocks cut out but beyond us the prospect loomed just as difficult and as dangerous we could cut out no more of the ridge we had tried place after place and could reach it safely at no point further along the snow slopes broke off with the same sharp cleavage the whole ridge displayed two thousand five hundred feet above there was no other approach the shattered ridge so our task lay plain and onerous enormously more dangerous and laborious than that which our predecessors encountered we must cut steps in those ice blocks over them around them on the sheer sides of them under them whatever seemed to our judgment the best way of circumventing each individual block every ten yards presented a separate problem here was a sharp black rock standing up in a setting of ice as thin and narrow and steep as the claws that hold the stone in a finger ring that ice must be chopped down level and then steps cut all round the rock it took a solid hour to pass that rock here was a great bluff of ice with snow so loose and at such a sharp angle about it that passage had to be hewed up and over and down it again on either side the ridge fell precipitously to the glacier floor with yawning crevasses half way down eagerly swallowing every particle of ice and snow that our axes dislodged on the right hand to the west fork of the muldrow glacier by which we had journeyed hither on the left to the east fork of the same perhaps one thousand five hundred feet perhaps two thousand feet lower at the gap in the ridge with the ice gable on the other side of it the difficulty and the danger were perhaps at their greatest it took the best part of a day's cutting to make steps down the slope and then straight up the face of the enormous ice mass that confronted us the steps had to be made deep and wide it was not merely one passage we were making these steps would be traversed again and again by men with heavy packs as we relayed our food and camp equipage along this ridge and we were determined from the first to take no unnecessary risks whatever we realized that the passage of this shattered ridge was an exceedingly risky thing at best to go along it day after day seemed like tempting providence we were resolved that nothing on our part should be lacking that could contribute to safety day by day we advanced a little further and returned to camp the hall of the mountain king the weather doubled the time and the tedium of the passage of this ridge from whit sunday to trinity sunday inclusive there were only two days that we could make progress on the ridge at all and on one of those days the clouds from the coast poured over so densely and enveloped us so completely that it was impossible to see far enough ahead to lay out a course wisely on that day we toppled over into the abyss a mass of ice as big as a two-story house that must have weighed hundreds of tons it was poised upon two points of another ice mass and held upright by a flying buttress of wind-hardened snow three or four blows from karsten's axe sent it hurling downward it passed out of our view into the cloud smother immediately but we heard it bound and rebound until it burst with a report like a cannon and some days later we saw its fragments strewn all over the flat two thousand feet below what a sight it must have been last july when the whole ridge was heaving shattering and showering down its bergs upon the glacier floors one day we were driven off the ridge by a high wind that threatened to sweep us from our footholds on another a fine morning gave place to a sudden dense snowstorm that sent us quickly below again always all day long while we were on that ridge the distant thunder of avalanches resounded from the great basin far above us into which the two summits of denali were continually discharging their snows it sounded as though the king of denmark were drinking healths all day long to the salvos of his artillery that custom more honoured in the breach than in the observance from such fancy the mind passed easily enough to the memory of that astonishing composition of Grieg's in the hall of the mountain king and once recalled the stately yet staccato rhythm ran in one's ears continually 
for if we had many days of cloud and smother of vapour that blotted out everything when a fine day came how brilliant beyond all that lower levels know it was from our perch on that ridge the lofty peaks and massive ridges rose on every side as little by little we gained higher and higher eminence the view broadened and ever new peaks and ridges thrust themselves into view we were within the hall of the mountain kings indeed kings nameless here in this multitude of lofty summits but that elsewhere in the world would have each one his name and story and how eager and impatient we were to rise high enough to progress far enough on that ridge that we might gaze into the great basin itself from which the thunderings came the spacious hall of the two lords paramount of all the mountains of the continent the north and south peaks of denali our hearts beat high with the anticipation not only of gazing upon it but of entering it and pitching our tent in the midst of its august solitudes to come down again for there was as yet no spot reached on that splintered backbone where we might make a camp to pass day after day in our tent on the glacier floor waiting for the bad weather to be done that we might essay it again to watch the tantalizing and as it seemed meaningless fluctuations of the barometer for encouragement to listen to the driving wind and the swirling snow how tedious that was camp on the ridge at last when we had been camped for three weeks at the head of the glacier losing scarce an hour of usable weather but losing by far the greater part of the time when the advance party the day before had reached a tiny flat on the ridge where they thought camp could be made we took a sudden desperate resolve to move to the ridge at any cost all the camp contained that would be needed above was made up quickly into four packs and we struck out staggering under our loads before we reached the first slope of the ridge each man knew in his heart that we were attempting altogether too much even karstens who had packed his hundred and a quarter day after day over the chilkoot pass in eighteen ninety seven admitted that he was heavy but we were saved the chagrin of acknowledging that we had undertaken more than we could accomplish for before we reached the steep slope of the ridge a furious snowstorm had descended upon us and we were compelled to return to camp the next day we proceeded more wisely we took up half the stuff and dug out a camping place and pitched the little tent every step had to be shoveled out for the previous day's snow had filled it as had happened so many times before and it took five and one half hours to reach the new camping place on sunday twenty fifth may the first sunday after trinity we took up the rest of the stuff and established ourselves at a new climbing base about thirteen thousand feet high and one thousand five hundred feet above the glacier floor not to descend again until we descended for good we were now much nearer our work and it progressed much faster although as the ridge rose it became steeper and steeper and even more rugged and chaotic and the difficulty and danger of its passage increased our situation up here was decidedly pleasanter than below we had indeed exchanged our large tent for a small one in which we could sit upright but could not stand and so narrow that the four of us lying side by side had to make mutual agreement to turn over our comfortable wood stove for the little kerosene stove yet when the clouds cleared we had a noble wide prospect and there was not the sense of damp immurement that the floor of the glacier gave the sun struck our tent at four thirty a m which is nearly two and one half hours earlier than we received his rays below and lingered with us long after our glacier camp was in the shadow of the north peak moreover instead of being colder as we expected it was warmer the minimum ranging around zero instead of around ten degrees below clouds and climate the rapidity with which the weather changed up here was a continual source of surprise to us at one moment the skies would be clear the peaks and the ridge standing out with brilliant definition literally five minutes later they would be all blotted out by dense volumes of vapor that poured over from the south perhaps ten minutes more and the cloud had swept down upon the glacier and all above would be clear again or it might be the vapor deepened and thickened into a heavy snowstorm 
sometimes everything below was visible and nothing above and a few minutes later everything below would be obscured and everything above revealed this great crescent range is indeed our rampart against the hateful humidity of the coast and gives to us in the interior the dry windless exhilarating cold that is characteristic of our winters we owe it mainly to this range that our snowfall averages about six feet instead of the thirty or forty feet that falls on the coast the winds that sweep northward toward this mountain range are saturated with moisture from the warm waters of the pacific ocean but contact with the lofty colds condenses the moisture into clouds and precipitates most of it on the southern slopes as snow still bearing all the moisture their lessened temperature will allow the clouds pour through every notch and gap in the range and press resolutely onward and downward streaming along the glaciers toward the interior but all the time of their passage they are parting with their moisture for the snow is falling from them continually in their course they reach the interior indeed and spread out triumphant over the lowlands but most of their burden has been deposited along the way one is reminded of the government train of mules from fort egbert that used to supply the remote posts of the strategic telegraph line before strategy yielded to economy and the useless line was abandoned when the train reached the tanana crossing it had eaten up nine-tenths of its original load and only one-tenth remained for the provisioning of the post so these clouds were being squeezed like a sponge every saddle they pushed through squeezed them every peak and ridge they surmounted squeezed them every glacier floor they crept down squeezed them and they reached the interior valleys attenuated depleted and relatively harmless aneroids the aneroids had kept fairly well with the mercurial barometer and the boiling point thermometer until we moved up to the ridge from this time they displayed a progressive discrepancy therewith that put them out of serious consideration and one was as bad as the other eleven thousand feet seemed the limit of their good behavior to set them back day by day like captain cuttle's watch would be to depend wholly upon the other instruments anyway and this is just what we did not troubling to adjust them they were read and recorded merely because that routine had been established says burns there was a lad was born in kaya but one a day o oh, what a style i doubt it's hardly worth the while to be say nice wi robin so they were just aneroids aluminum cases jeweled movements army officer patented improvements q certificates import duty and all just aneroids and one was as bad as the other within their limitations they are exceedingly useful instruments but it is folly to depend on them for measuring great heights perched up here the constant struggle of the clouds from the humid south to reach the interior was interesting to watch and one readily understood that denali and his lesser companions are a prime factor in the climate of interior alaska day by day karstens and walter would go up and resume the finding and making of a way and tatum and the writer would relay the stuff from the camp to a cache some five hundred feet above and thence to another the grand objective point towards which the advance party was working was the earthquake cleavage a clean sharp cut in the ice and snow of fifty feet in height above that point all was smooth though fearfully steep below was the confusion the earthquake had wrought each day Carstens felt sure they would reach the break but each day as they advanced toward it the distance lengthened and the intricate difficulties increased more than once a passage painfully hewn in the solid ice had to be abandoned because it gave no safe exit and some other passage found at last the cleavage was reached and it proved the most ticklish piece of the whole ridge to get around just below it was a loose snow slope at a dangerous angle where it seemed only the initial impulse was needed for an avalanche to bear it all below and just before crossing that snow slope was a wall of overhanging ice beneath which steps must be cut for one hundred yards every yard of which endangered the climber by disputing the passage of the pack upon his shoulders the primus stove 
late in the evening of the twenty seventh may looking up the ridge upon our return from relaying a load to the cache we saw karstens and walter standing clear-cut against the sky upon the surface of the unbroken snow above the earthquake cleavage tatum and i gave a great shout of joy and far above us as they were they heard us and waved their response we watched them advance upon the steep slope of the ridge until the usual cloud descended and blotted them out the way was clear to the top of the ridge now and that night our spirits were high and congratulations were showered upon the victorious pioneers the next day when they would have gone on to the pass the weather drove them back on that smooth steep exposed slope a wind too high for safety beat upon them accompanied by driving snow that day a little accident happened that threatened our whole enterprise on such small threads do great undertakings hang the prima stove is an admirable device for heating and cooking superior one thinks to all the new-fangled alcohol utilities but it has a weak point the fine stream of kerosene which under pressure from the air pump is impinged against the perforated copper cup heated to redness by burning alcohol and is thus vaporized first passes through several convolutions of pipe within the burner and then issues from a hole so fine that some people would not call it a hole at all but an orifice or something like that that little hole is the weak spot of the prima stove sometimes it gets clogged and then a fine wire mounted upon some sort of handle must be used to dislodge the obstruction now the worst thing that can happen to a prima stove is to get the wire pricker broken off in the burner hole and that is what happened to us without a special tool that we did not possess it is impossible to get at that burner to unscrew it and without unscrewing it the broken wire cannot be removed tatum and i turned the stove upside down and beat upon it and tapped it but nothing would dislodge that wire it looked remarkably like no supper it looked alarmingly like no more stove how we wished we had brought the other stove from the launch also every bow on an undertaking like this should have two strings but when karstens came back he went to work at once and this was one of the many occasions when his resourcefulness was of the utmost service with a file and his usual ingenuity he constructed out of the spoon bowl of a pipe cleaner the writer had in his pocket the special tool necessary to grip that little burner and soon the burner was unscrewed and the broken wire taken out and the primus was purring away merrily again melting the water for supper we feel sure that we would have pushed on even had we been without fire the pemmican was cooked already and could be eaten as it was and one does not die of thirst in the midst of snow but calm reflection will hardly allow that we could have reached the summit had we been deprived of all means of cooking and heating germless air on this ridge the dough refused to sour and since our baking powder was consumed in the fire we were henceforth without bread a cold night killed the germ in the sourdough and we were never again able to set up a fermentation in it doubtless the air at this altitude is free from the necessary spores or germs of ferment pasteur's and tyndall's experiments on the alps which resulted in the overthrow of the theory of spontaneous generation and the rehabilitation of the old dogma that life comes only from life were recalled with interest but without much satisfaction we tried all sorts of ways of cooking the flour but none with any success next to the loss of sugar we felt the loss of bread and in the food longings that overtook us bread played a large part on friday thirtieth may the way had been prospected right up to the pass which gives entrance to the grand basin a camping place had been dug out there and a first load of stuff carried through and cached so on that morning we broke camp and the four of us roped together began the most important advance we had made yet with stiff packs on our backs we toiled up the steps that had been cut with so much pains and stopped at the cache just below the cleavage to add yet further burdens all day nothing was visible beyond our immediate environment and again and again one would have liked to photograph the sensational looking traverse of some particularly difficult ice obstacle but the mist enveloped everything 
just before we reached the smooth snow slope above the range of the earthquake disturbance lay one of the really dangerous passages of the climb a perilous passage it is easier to describe the difficulty and danger of this particular portion of the ascent than to give a clear impression to the reader of other places almost as hazardous directly below the earthquake cleavage was an enormous mass of ice detached from the cleavage wall from below it had seemed connected with that wall and much time and toil had been expended in cutting steps up it and along its crest only to find a great gulf fixed so it was necessary to pass along its base now from its base there fell away at an exceedingly sharp angle scarcely exceeding the angle of repose a slope of soft loose snow and at the very top of that slope where it actually joined the wall of ice offered the only possible passage the wall was in the main perpendicular and turned at a right angle midway just where it turned a great mass bulged out and overhung this traverse was so long that with both ropes joined it was still necessary for three of the four members of the party to be on the snow slope at once two men out of sight of the others any one familiar with alpine work will realize immediately the great danger of such a traverse there was however no avoiding it or at whatever cost we should have done so twice already the passage had been made by karstens and walter but not with heavy packs and one man was always on ice while the other was on snow this time all four must pass bearing all that men could bear cautiously the first man ventured out setting foot exactly where foot had been set before the three others solidly anchored on the ice paying out the rope and keeping it taut when all the first section of rope was gone the second man started and when in turn his rope was paid out the third man started leaving the last man on the ice holding to the rope this of course was the most dangerous part of this passage if one of the three had slipped it would have been almost impossible for the others to hold him and if he had pulled the others down it would have been quite impossible for the solitary man on the ice to have withstood the strain when the first man reached solid ice again there was another equally dangerous minute or two for then all three behind him were on the snow slope the beetling cliff where the trail turned at right angles was the acutely dangerous spot with heavy and bulky packs it was exceedingly difficult to squeeze past this projection ice gives no such entrance to the point of the axe as hard snow does yet the only aid in steadying the climber and in somewhat relieving his weight on the loose snow was afforded by such purchase upon the ice wall shoulder high as that point could effect not a word was spoken by any one all along the ice wall rang in the writer's ears that preposterous line from the hunting of the snark silence not even a shriek it was with a deep and thankful relief that we found ourselves safely across and when a few minutes later we had climbed the steep snow that lay against the cleavage wall and were at last upon the smooth unbroken crest of the ridge we realized that probably the worst place in the entire climb was behind us steep to the very limit of climbability as that ridge was it was the easiest going we had had since we left the glacier floor the steps were already cut it was only necessary to lift one foot after the other and set the toe well in the hole with the ice axe buried afresh in the snow above at every step but each step meant the lifting not only of one's self but of one's load and the increasing altitude perhaps aggravated by the dense vapour with which the air was charged made the advance exceedingly fatiguing from below the foreshortened ridge seemed only of short length and of moderate grade could we but reach it a tantalizingly easy passage to the upper glacier it looked as we chopped our way little by little nearer and nearer to it but once upon it it lengthened out endlessly the skyline always just a little above us but never getting any closer the coxcomb just before reaching the steepest pitch of the ridge where it sweeps up in a coxcomb we came upon the vestiges of a camp made by our predecessors of a year before in a hollow dug in the snow an empty biscuit carton and a raisin package some trash and brown paper and discoloured snow as fresh as though they had been left yesterday instead of a year ago truly 
the terrific storms of this region are like the storms of guy wetmore carroll's clever rhyme that come early and avoid the rush they will sweep a man off his feet as once threatened to our advance party but will pass harmlessly over a cigarette stump and a cardboard box our tent in the glacier basin ramparted by a wall of ice blocks as high as itself we found overwhelmed and prostrate upon our return but the willow shoots with which we had staked our trail upon the glacier were all standing long as it was the slope was ended at last and we came straight to the great upstanding granite slabs amongst which is the natural camping place in the pass that gives access to the grand basin we named that pass the parker pass and the rock tower of the ridge that rises immediately above it the most conspicuous feature of this region from below we named the brown tower the parker brown party was the first to camp at this spot for the astonishing sourdough pioneers made no camp at all above the low saddle of the ridge as it then existed but took all the way to the summit of the north peak in one gigantic stride the names of parker and brown should surely be permanently associated with this mountain they were so nearly successful in climbing and we found no better places to name for them there is only one difficulty about naming of this pass strictly speaking it is not a pass at all and the writer does not know of any mountaineering term that technically describes it yet it should bear a name for it is the doorway to the upper glacier through which all those who would reach the summit must enter on the one hand rises the brown tower with a northeast ridge sweeping away beyond it toward the south peak on the other hand the ice of the upper glacier plunges to its fall the upstanding blocks of granite on a little level shoulder of the ridge lead around to the base of the cliffs of the northeast ridge and it is around the base of those cliffs that the way lies to the midst of the grand basin so the parker pass we called it and desire that it should be named Karsten's ridge and while names are before us the writer should ask permission to bestow another having nothing to his credit in the matter at all as the narrative has already indicated he feels free to say that in his opinion the conquest of the difficulties of the earthquake shattered ridge was an exploit that called for high qualities of judgment and cautious daring and would he thinks be considered a brilliant piece of mountaineering anywhere in the world he would like to name that ridge karsten's ridge in honor of the man who with walter's help cut that staircase three miles long amid the perilous complexities of its chaotic ice blocks when we reached the parker pass all the world beneath us was shrouded in dense mist but all above us was bathed in bright sunshine the great slabs of granite were like a gateway through which the grand basin opened to our view the ice of the upper glacier which fills the grand basin came terracing down from some four thousand feet above us and six miles beyond us with progressive leaps of jagged blue serac between the two peaks of the mountain and almost at our feet fell away with cataract curve to its precipitation four thousand feet below us across the glacier were the sheer dark cliffs of the north peak soaring to an almost immediate summit twenty thousand feet above the sea on the left in the distance was just visible the receding snow dome of the south peak with its two horns some five hundred feet higher the mists were passing from the distant summits curtain after curtain of gauze draping their heads for a moment and sweeping on we made our camp between the granite slabs on the natural camping site that offered itself and a shovel and an empty alcohol can proclaimed that our predecessors of last year had done the same the next morning the weather had almost completely cleared and the view below us burst upon our eyes as we came out of the tent into the still air parker pass the parker pass is the most splendid coin of vantage of the whole mountain except the summit itself from an elevation of something more than fifteen thousand feet one overlooks the whole alaskan range and the scope of view to the east to the northeast and to the southeast is uninterrupted mountain range rises beyond mountain range until only the snowy summits are visible in the great distance and one knows that beyond the last of them lies the open sea the nearby peaks and ridges red with granite or black with shale and gullied from top to bottom with snow and ice 
the broad highways of glaciers at their feet carrying parallel moraines that look like giant tramlines stand out with vivid distinction a lofty peak that we suppose is mount hunter towers above the lesser summits the two arms of the muldrow glacier start right in the foreground and reveal themselves from their heads to their junction and then to the terminal snout receiving their groaning tributaries from every evacuating height the dim blue lowlands now devoid of snow stretch away to the northeast with threads of streams and patches of lake that still carry ice along their banks and all this splendor and diversity yielded itself up to us at once that was the most sensational and spectacular feature of it we went to sleep in a smother of mist we had seen nothing as we climbed we rose to a clear sparkling day the clouds were mysteriously rolling away from the lowest depths the last wisps of vapor were sweeping over the ultimate heights here one would like to camp through a whole week of fine weather could such a week ever be counted upon higher than any point in the united states the top of the brown tower probably on a level with the top of mont blanc it is yet not so high as to induce the acute breathlessness from which the writer suffered later upon any exertion the climbing of the tower the traversing to the other side of it the climbing of the ridge would afford pleasant excursions while the opportunity for careful though difficult photography would be unrivalled even in thick weather the clouds are mostly below and their rapid movement the kaleidoscopic changes which their coming and going their thickening and thinning their rising and falling produce are never a failing source of interest and pleasure the changes of light and shade the gradations of color were sometimes wonderfully delicate and charming seen through rapidly attenuating mist the bold crags of the icy ridge between the glacier arms in the foreground would give a soft french gray that became a luminous mauve before it sprang into dazzling black and white in the sunshine in the sunshine indeed the whole landscape was hard and brilliant and lacked half tones as in the main it lacked color but when the vapor drew the gauze of its veil over it there came rich soft elusive tints that were no more than hinted ere they were gone the himalayas here with nothing but rock and ice and snow around nine thousand feet above any sort of vegetation even in the summer it was of interest to remember that at the same altitude in the himalayas good crops of barley and millet are raised and apples are grown while at a thousand feet or so lower the apricot is ripened on the terrace gardens karstens and walter had brought up a load each on their reconnaissance trip four heavy loads had been brought up the day before there were yet two loads to be carried up from the cache below the cleavage and tatum and walter always ready to take the brunt of it volunteered to bring them so down the dreadful ridge once more the boys went while karstens and the writer prospected ahead for a route into the grand basin the storms and snows of ten or a dozen winters may make a steep but practicable snow slope of the northeast ridge again one winter only had passed since the convulsion that disrupted it and already the snow was beginning to build up its gaps and chasms all the summer through for many hours on clear days the sun will melt those snows and the frost at night will glaze them into ice the more conformable ice blocks will gradually be cemented together while the fierce winds that beat upon the ridge will wear away the supports of the more egregious and unstable blocks and one by one they will topple into the abyss on this side or on that it will probably never again be the smooth homogeneous slope it has been the gable will probably always present a wide cleft but the slopes beyond it stripped now of their accumulated ice so as to be unclimbable may build up again and give access to the ridge the point about one thousand five hundred feet above the gable where the earthquake cleavage took place will perhaps remain the crux of the climb the ice wall rises forty or fifty feet sheer and the broken masses below it are especially difficult and precipitous but with care and time and pains it can be surmounted even as we surmounted it the wind and sun and storm may mollify the forbidding abruptness of even this break in the course of time the denali problem with the exception of this ridge denali is not a mountain that presents special mountaineering difficulties of a technical kind 
its difficulties lie in its remoteness its size the great distances of snow and ice its climbing must include the passage of the burdens that must be carried over those distances we estimated that it was twenty miles of actual linear distance from the pass by which we reached the muldrow glacier to the summit in the height of summer its snow line will not be higher than seven thousand feet while at the best season for climbing it the spring the snow line is much lower its climbing is like nearly all alaskan problems essentially one of transportation but the northeast ridge in its present condition adds all the spice of sensation and danger that any man could desire end of chapter three Chapter Four of the Ascent of Denali by Hudson Stuck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Grand Basin. The reader will perhaps be able to sympathize with the feeling of elation and confidence which came to us when we had surmounted the difficulties of the ridge and had arrived at the entrance to the Grand Basin. We realized that the greater and more arduous part of our task was done, and the way now lay open before us. For so long a time, this point had been the actual goal of our efforts. For so long a time, we had gazed upward at it, with hope deferred, that its final attainment was accompanied with no small sense of triumph and gratification, and with a great accession of faith that we should reach the top of the mountain. Heat and Cold the ice of the glacier that fills the basin was hundreds of feet beneath us at the pass but it rises so rapidly that by a short traverse under the cliffs of the ridge we were able to reach its surface and select a camping site thereon at about sixteen thousand feet it was bitterly cold with a keen wind that descended in gusts from the heights and the slow movement of step cutting gave the man in the rear no opportunity of warming up toes and fingers grew numb despite multiple socks within mammoth moccasins and thick gloves within fur mittens from this time during our stay in the grand basin and until we had left it and descended again the weather progressively cleared and brightened until all clouds were dispersed from time to time there were fresh descents of vapor and even short snowstorms but there was no general enveloping of the mountain again cold it was at times even in the sunshine with a nipping and an eager air but when the wind ceased it would grow intensely hot on the fourth june at three p m the thermometer in the full sunshine rose to fifty degrees fahrenheit the highest temperature recorded on the whole excursion and the fatigue of packing in that thin atmosphere with the sun's rays reflected from ice and snow everywhere was most exhausting we were burned as brown as indians lips and noses split and peeled in spite of continual applications of lanolin but thanks to those most beneficent amber snow glasses no one of the party had the slightest trouble with his eyes at night it was always cold ten degrees below zero being the highest minimum during our stay in the grand basin and twenty one degrees below zero the lowest but we always slept warm with sheepskins and caribou skins under us and down quilts and camel's hair blankets and a wolf robe for bedding the four of us lay in that six by seven tent in one bed snug and comfortable it was disgraceful overcrowding but it was warm the fierce little primus stove pumped up to its limit and perfectly consuming its kerosene fuel shot out its corona of beautiful blue flame and warmed the tight tiny tent the prima stove burning seven hours on a quart of coal oil is a little giant for heat generation if we had had two so that one could have served for cooking and one for heating we should not have suffered from the cold at all but as it was whenever the stew pot went on the stove or a pot full of ice to melt the heat was immediately absorbed by the vessel and not distributed through the tent but another prima stove would have been another five or six pounds to pack and we were heavy all the time as it was the labor of packing something has already been said about the fatigue of packing and one would not weary the reader with continual reference thereto 
yet it is certain that those who have carried a pack only on the lower levels cannot conceive how enormously greater the labor is at these heights as one rises and the density of the air is diminished so it would seem the weight of the pack or the effect of the weight of the pack is in the same ratio increased we probably moved from three hundred to two hundred and fifty pounds decreasing somewhat as food and fuel were consumed each time camp was advanced in the grand basin we could have done with a good deal less as it fell out but this we did not know and we were resolved not to be defeated in our purpose by lack of supplies but the packing of these loads relaying them forward and all the time steeply rising was labor of the most exhausting and fatiguing kind and there is no possible way in which it may be avoided in the ascent of this mountain to roam over glaciers and scramble up peaks free and untrammeled is mountaineering in the alps put a forty-pound pack on a man's back with the knowledge that tomorrow he must go down for another and you have mountaineering in alaska in the ascent of this twenty thousand foot mountain every member of the party climbed at least sixty thousand feet it is this going down and doing it all over again that is the heart-breaking part of climbing it was in the grand basin that the writer began to be affected by the altitude to be disturbed by a shortness of breath that with each advance grew more distressingly acute while at rest he was not troubled mere existence imposed no unusual burden but even a slight exertion would be followed by a spell of panting and climbing with a pack was interrupted at every dozen or score of steps by the necessity of stopping to regain breath there was no nausea or headache or any other symptom of mountain sickness indeed it is hard for us to understand that affection as many climbers describe it it has been said again and again to resemble seasickness in all its symptoms now the writer is of the unfortunate company that are seasick on the slightest provocation even rough water on the wide stretches of the lower yukon when a wind is blowing upstream and the launch is pitching and tossing will give him qualms but no one of the four of us had any such feeling on the mountain at any time shortness of breath we all suffered from though none other so acutely as myself when it was evident that the progress of the party was hindered by the constant stops on my account the contents of my pack were distributed amongst the others and my load reduced to the mercurial barometer and the instruments and later to the mercurial barometer alone it was some mortification not to be able to do one's share of the packing but there was no help for it and the other shoulders were young and strong and kindly tobacco with some hope of improving his wind the writer had reduced his smoking to two pipes a day so soon as the head of the glacier had been reached and had abandoned tobacco altogether when camp was first made on the ridge but it is questionable if smoking in moderation has much or any effect Karstens, who smoked continually and walter who had never smoked in his life had the best wind of the party it is probably much more a matter of age Karstens was a man of thirty-two years and the two boys were just twenty-one while the writer approached fifty none of us slept as well as usual except walter and nothing ever interferes with his sleep but although our slumbers were short and broken they seemed to bring recuperation just as though they had been sound we arose fresh in the morning though we had slept little and light on the thirtieth may we had made our camp at the parker pass on the second june the finest and brightest day in three weeks we moved to our first camp in the grand basin on the third june we moved camp again out into the middle of the glacier at about sixteen thousand five hundred feet here we were at the upper end of one of the flats of the glacier that fills the grand basin the serac of another great rise just above us the walls of the north peak grow still more striking and picturesque here where they attain their highest elevation these granite ramparts falling three thousand feet sheer swell out into bellying buttresses with snow slopes between them as they descend to the glacier floor while on top above the granite 
each peak point and crest ridge is tipped with black shale how comes that ugly black shale with the fragments of which all the lower glacier is strewn to have such lofty eminence and granite guarded distinction as though it were the most beautiful or the most valuable thing in the world the mckinley fork of the kantishna which drains the muldrow is black as ink with it and its presence can be detected in the tanana river itself as far as its junction with the yukon it is largely soluble in water and where melting snow drips over it on the glacier walls below were great splotches for all the world as though a gigantic ink pot had been upset the flagstaff while we sat resting a while on our way to this camp gazing at these pinnacles of the north peak we fell to talking about the pioneer climbers of this mountain who claimed to have set a flagstaff near the summit of the north peak as to which feat a great deal of incredulity existed in alaska for several reasons and we renewed our determination that if the weather permitted when we had reached our goal and ascended the south peak we would climb the north peak also to seek for traces of this earliest exploit on denali which is dealt with at length in another place in this book all at once walter cried out i see the flagstaff eagerly pointing to the rocky prominence nearest the summit the summit itself is covered with snow he added i see it plainly karstens looking where he pointed saw it also and whipping out the field glasses one by one we all looked and saw it distinctly standing out against the sky with the naked eye i was never able to see it unmistakably but through the glasses it stood out sturdy and strong one side covered with crusted snow we were greatly rejoiced that we could carry down positive confirmation of this matter it was no longer necessary for us to ascend the north peak the upper glacier also bore plain signs of the earthquake that had shattered the ridge huge blocks of ice were strewn upon it ripped off the left-hand wall but it was nowhere crevassed as badly as the lower glacier but much more broken up into serac some of the bergs presented very beautiful sights wind-carved incrustations of snow in cameo upon their blue surface giving a suggestion of wedgewood pottery all tints seem more delicate and beautiful up here than on the lower glacier on the fifth june we advanced to about seventeen thousand five hundred feet right up the middle of the glacier as we rose that morning slowly out of the flat in which our tent was pitched and began to climb the steep serac clouds that had been gathering below swept rapidly up into the grand basin and others swept as rapidly over the summits and down upon us in a few moments we were in a dense smother of vapor with nothing visible a couple of hundred yards away then the temperature dropped and soon snow was falling which increased to a heavy snowstorm that raged an hour we made our camp and ate our lunch and by that time the smother of vapor passed the sun came out hot again and we were all simultaneously overtaken with a deep drowsiness and slept then out into the glare again to go down and bring up the remainder of the stuff we went and that night we were established in our last camp but one we had decided to go up at least five hundred feet farther that we might have the less to climb when we made our final attack upon the peak so when we returned with the loads from below we did not stop at camp but carried them forward and cached them against tomorrow's final move last camp on friday the sixth june we made our last move and pitched our tent in a flat near the base of the ridge just below the final rise in the glacier of the grand basin at about eighteen thousand feet and we were able to congratulate one another on making the highest camp ever made in north america i set up and read the mercurial barometer and when corrected for its own temperature it stood at fifteen point zero six one the boiling point thermometer registered one hundred eighty point five as the point at which water boiled with an air temperature of thirty five degrees it took one hour to boil the rice for supper the aneroids stood at fourteen point eight and fourteen point nine still steadily losing on the mercurial barometer 
i think that a rough altitude gauge could be calculated from the time rice takes to boil at least as reliable as an aneroid barometer at the parker pass it took fifty minutes here it took sixty this is about the height of perpetual snow on the great himalayan peaks but we had been above the perpetual snow line for forty-eight days we were now within about two thousand five hundred feet of the summit and had two weeks full supply of food and fuel which at a pinch could be stretched to three weeks certain things were short the chocolate and figs and raisins and salt were low of zwieback there remained but two and one-half packages reserved against lunch when we attacked the summit but the meatballs the herbs worst the caribou jelly the rice and the tea our staples were abundant for two weeks with four gallons of coal oil and a gallon of alcohol the end of our painful transportation hither was accomplished we were within one day's climb of the summit with supplies to besiege if the weather should prove persistently bad we could wait we could advance our parallels could put another camp on the ridge itself at nineteen thousand feet and yet another halfway up the dome if we had to fight our way step by step and could advance but a couple of hundred feet a day we were still confident that barring unforeseen misfortunes we could reach the top but we wanted a clear day on top that the observations we designed to make could be made it would be a poor success that did but set our feet on the highest point and we felt sure that prepared as we were to wait the clear day would come as so often happens when everything unpropitious is guarded against nothing unpropitious occurs it would have been a wonderful chance indeed if supplied for only one day a fine clear day had come but supplied against bad weather for two or three weeks it was no wonder at all that the very first day should have presented itself bright and clear we had exhausted our bad fortune below here at the junction above all others at which we should have chosen to enjoy it we were to encounter our good fortune breathlessness but here where all signs seemed to promise success to the expedition the author began to have fears of personal failure the story of mr fitzgerald's expedition to anconcagua came to his mind and he recalled that although every other member of the party reached the summit that gentleman himself was unable to do so in the last stage the difficulty of breathing had increased with fits of smothering and the medicine chest held no remedy for blind staggers end of chapter four chapter five of the ascent of denali by hudson stuck this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Ultimate Height We lay down for a few hours on the night of the 6th June, resolved to rise at three in the morning for our attempt upon the summit of Denali. At supper, Walter had made a desperate effort to use some of our ten pounds of flour in the manufacture of noodles, with which to thicken the stew we had continued to pack that flour and had made effort after effort to cook it in some edible way but without success the sourdough would not ferment and we had no baking powder is there any way to cook flour under such circumstances but he made the noodles too large and did not cook them enough and they wrought internal havoc upon those who partook of them three of the four of us were unwell all night the digestion is certainly more delicate and more easily disturbed at great altitudes than at the lower levels while karstens and tatum were tossing uneasily in the bedclothes the writer sat up with a blanket round his shoulders crouching over the primus stove with the thermometer at minus twenty one degrees fahrenheit outdoors walter alone was at ease with digestive and somnolent capabilities proof against any invasion it was of course broad daylight all night at three the company was aroused and after partaking of a very light breakfast indeed we sallied forth into the brilliant clear morning with not a cloud in the sky the only packs we carried that day were the instruments and the lunch the sun was shining but a keen north wind was blowing and the thermometer stood at minus four degrees fahrenheit we were a rather sorry company 
Karsten still had internal pains. Tatum and I had severe headaches. Walter was the only one feeling entirely himself, so Walter was put in the lead, and in the lead he remained all day. Start to the summit. Cold. We took a straight course up the great snow ridge directly south of our camp, and then around the peak into which it rises. Quickly told, but slowly and most laboriously done. It was necessary to make the traverse high up on this peak instead of around its base. So much had its ice and snow been shattered by the earthquake on the lower portions. Once around this peak, there rose before us the Horseshoe Ridge, which carries the ultimate height of Denali, a horseshoe ridge of snow, opening to the east, with a low snow peak at either end, the center of the ridge soaring above both peaks. Above us was nothing visible but snow. The rocks were all beneath, the last rock standing at about 19,000 feet. Our progress was exceedingly slow. It was bitterly cold. All the morning, toes and fingers were without sensation. Kick them and beat them as we would. We were all clad in full winter hand and foot gear, more gear than had sufficed at fifty degrees below zero on the Yukon Trail. Within the writer's number sixteen moccasins were three pairs of heavy hand-knitted woolen socks, two pairs of camel's hair socks, and a pair of thick felt socks, while underneath them, between them and the iron creepers, were the soles cut from a pair of felt shoes. Upon his hands were a pair of the thickest scotch wool gloves, thrust inside huge lynx paw mitts lined with Hudson Bay duffel. His moose-hide breeches and shirt, worn all the winter on the trail, were worn throughout this climb. Over the shirt was a thick sweater, and over all the usual Alaska parkey, amply furred around the hood. Underneath was a suit of the heaviest Jaeger underwear. Yet until nine noon, feet were like lumps of iron, and fingers were constantly numb. That north wind was cruelly cold, and there can be no possible question that cold is felt much more keenly in the thin air of 19,000 feet than it is below. But the north wind was really our friend, for nothing but a north wind will drive all vapor from this mountain. Karstens beat his feet so violently and so continually against the hard snow to restore the circulation that two of his toenails sloughed off afterward. By eleven o'clock we had been climbing for six hours and were well around the peak, advancing toward the Horseshoe Ridge. But even then there were grave doubts if we should succeed in reaching it that day. It was so cold. A hint from any member of the party that his feet were actually freezing a hint expected all along would have sent us all back when there is no sensation left in the feet at all it is however difficult to be quite sure if they be actually freezing or not and each one was willing to give the attempt upon the summit the benefit of the doubt what should we have done with the ordinary leather climbing boots but once entirely around the peak we were in a measure sheltered from the north wind and the sun full upon us gave more warmth it was hereabouts, and not, surely, at the point indicated in the photograph in Mr. Belmore Brown's book, that the climbing party of last year was driven back by the blizzard that descended upon them when close to their goal. Not until we had stopped for lunch and had drunk the scalding tea from the thermos bottles did we all begin to have confidence that this day would see the completion of the ascent. But the writer's shortness of breath became more and more distressing as he rose. The familiar fits of panting took a more acute form. At such times, everything would turn black before his eyes, and he would choke and gasp and seem unable to get breath at all. Yet a few moments' rest restored him completely to struggle on another twenty or thirty paces and to sink gasping upon the snow again. All were more affected in the breathing than they had been at any time before. It was curious to see every man's mouth open for breathing, but none of the others in this distressing way. Before the traverse around the peak just mentioned, Walter had noticed the writer's growing discomfort and had insisted upon assuming the mercurial barometer. The boy's eager kindness was gladly accepted, and the instrument was surrendered. So it did not fall to the writer's credit to carry the thing to the top as he had wished. Climbing Irons The climbing grew steeper and steeper, 
the slope that had looked easy from below now seemed to shoot straight up for the most part the climbing irons gave us sufficient footing but here and there we came to softer snow where they would not take sufficient hold and we had to cut steps the cocks in these climbing irons were about an inch and a quarter long we wish they had been two inches the creepers are a great advantage in the matter of speed but they need long points they are not so safe as step cutting and there is the ever-present danger that unless one is exceedingly careful one will step upon the rope with them and their sharp cocks sever some of the strands they were however of great assistance and saved a great deal of laborious step cutting at last the crest of the ridge was reached and we stood well above the two peaks that marked the ends of the horseshoe also it was evident that we were well above the great north peak across the grand basin its crest had been like an index on the snow beside us as we climbed and we stopped for a few moments when it seemed that we were level with it we judged it to be about five hundred feet lower than the south peak but still there stretched ahead of us and perhaps one hundred feet above us another small ridge with a north and south pair of little haycock summits this is the real top of denali from below this ultimate ridge merges indistinguishably with the crest of the horseshoe ridge but it is not part of it but a culminating ridge beyond it with keen excitement we pushed on walter who had been in the lead all day was the first to scramble up a native alaskan he is the first human being to set foot upon the top of alaska's great mountain and had well earned the lifelong distinction Carstens and Tatum were hard upon his heels, but the last man on the rope, in his enthusiasm and excitement, somewhat overpassing his narrow wind margin, had almost to be hauled up the last few feet, and fell unconscious for a moment upon the floor of the little snow basin that occupies the top of the mountain. This, then, is the actual summit, a little crater-like snow basin, sixty or sixty-five feet long and twenty to twenty-five feet wide, with a haycock of snow at either end, the south one a little higher than the north. On the southwest, this little basin is much corniced, and the whole thing looked as though every severe storm might somewhat change its shape. So soon as wind was recovered, we shook hands all round, and a brief prayer of thanksgiving to Almighty God was said, that he had granted our heart's desire and brought us safely to the top of his great mountain the instrument readings this prime duty done we fell at once to our scientific tasks the instrument tent was set up the mercurial barometer taken out of its leather case and then out of its wooden case was swung upon its tripod and a rough zero established and it was left a while to adjust itself to conditions before a reading was attempted it was a great gratification to get it to the top uninjured. The boiling point apparatus was put together, and its candle lighted under the ice which filled its little cistern. The three-inch, three-circle aneroid was read at once at thirteen and two-tenths inches, its mendacious altitude scale confidently pointing at twenty-three thousand three hundred feet. Half an hour later it had dropped to thirteen point one seven five inches, and had shot us up another one hundred feet into the air soon the water was boiling in the little tubes of the boiling point thermometer and the steam pouring out of the vent the thread of mercury rose to one hundred seventy four point nine degrees and stayed there there is something definite and uncompromising about the boiling point hypsometer no tapping will make it rise or fall it reaches its mark unmistakably and does not budge the reading of the mercurial barometer is a slower and more delicate business. It takes a good light and a good sight to tell when the ivory zero point is exactly touching the surface of the mercury in the cistern. It takes care and precision to get the veneer exactly level with the top of the column. It was read, some half hour after it was set up, at 13.617 inches. The alcohol minimum thermometer stood at 7 degrees Fahrenheit, all the while we were on top. Meanwhile, Tatum had been reading a round of angles with the prismatic compass. He could not handle it with sufficient exactness with his mitts on, and he froze his fingers doing it barehanded. The View 
the scientific work accomplished then and not till then did we indulge ourselves in the wonderful prospect that stretched around us it was a perfectly clear day the sun shining brightly in the sky and not bounded our view save the natural limitations of vision immediately before us in the direction in which we had climbed lay nothing a void a sheer gulf many thousands of feet deep and one shrank back instinctively from the little parapet of the snow basin when one had glanced at the awful profundity across the gulf about three thousand feet beneath us and fifteen or twenty miles away sprang most splendidly into view the great mass of denali's wife or mount foraker as some white men misnamed her filling majestically all the middle distance it was our first glimpse of her during the whole ascent denali's wife does not appear at all save from the actual summit of denali for she is completely hidden by his south peak until the moment when his south peak is surmounted and never was nobler sight displayed to man than that great isolated mountain spread out completely with all its spurs and ridges its cliffs and its glaciers lofty and mighty and yet far beneath us on that spot one understood why the view of denali from lake mitchumina is the grand view for the west face drops abruptly down with nothing but that vast void from the top to nigh the bottom of the mountain beyond stretched blue and vague to the southwest the wide valley of the kuskokwim with an end of all mountains to the north we looked right over the north peak to the foothills below patched with lakes and lingering snow glittering with streams we had hoped to see the junction of the yukon and tanana rivers one hundred and fifty miles away to the northwest as we had often and often seen the summit of denali from that point in the winter but the haze that almost always qualifies a fine summer day inhibited that stretch of vision perhaps the forest fires we found raging on the tanana river were already beginning to foul the northern sky it was however to the south and the east that the most marvellous prospect opened before us what infinite tangle of mountain ranges filled the whole scene until grey sky grey mountain and grey sea merged in the ultimate distance the nearby peaks and ridges stood out with dazzling distinction the glaciation the drainage the relation of each part to the others all revealed the snow-covered tops of the remoter peaks dwindling and fading rose to our view as though floating in thin air when their bases were hidden by the haze and the beautiful crescent curve of the whole alaskan range exhibited itself from denali to the sea to the right hand the glittering tiny threads of streams draining the mountain range into the chulitna and shushitna rivers and so to cook's inlet and the pacific ocean spread themselves out to the left the affluence of the kantishna and the nanana drained the range into the yukon and bering sea yet the chief impression was not of our connection with the earth so far below its rivers and its seas but rather of detachment from it we seemed alone upon a dead world as dead as the mountains on the moon only once before can the writer remember a similar feeling of being neither in the world nor of the world and that was at the bottom of the grand canyon of the colorado in arizona its savage granite walls as dead as this savage peak of ice the dark sky above us the sky took a blue so deep that none of us had ever gazed upon a midday sky like it before it was a deep rich lustrous transparent blue as dark as a prussian blue but intensely blue a hue so strange so increasingly impressive that to one at least it seemed like special news of god as a new poet sings we first noticed the darkening tint of the upper sky in the grand basin and it deepened as we rose tyndall observed and discussed this phenomena in the alps but it seems scarcely to have been mentioned since it is difficult to describe at all the scene which the top of the mountain presented and impossible to describe it adequately one was not occupied with the thought of description but wholly possessed with the breadth and glory of it with its sheer amazing immensity and scope only once perhaps in any lifetime is such vision granted certainly never before had been vouchsafed to any of us 
not often in the summer time does denali completely unveil himself and dismiss the clouds from all the earth beneath yet we could not linger unique though the occasion dearly bought our privilege the miserable limitations of the flesh gave us continual warning to depart we grew colder and still more wretchedly cold the thermometer stood at seven degrees in the full sunshine and the north wind was keener than ever my fingers were so cold that i would not venture to withdraw them from the mittens to change the film in the camera and the other men were in like case indeed our hands were by this time so numb as to make it almost impossible to operate a camera at all a number of photographs had been taken though not half we should have liked to take but it is probable that however many more exposures had been made they would have been little better than those we got our top of the mountain photography was a great disappointment one thing we learned exposures at such altitude should be longer than those below perhaps owing to the darkness of the sky the stars and stripes when the mercurial barometer had been read the tent was thrown down and abandoned the first of a series of abandonments that marked our descent from the mountain the tent pole was used for a moment as a flagstaff while tatum hoisted a little united states flag he had patiently and skillfully constructed in our camps below out of two silk handkerchiefs and the cover of a sewing bag then the pole was put to its permanent use it had already been carved with a suitable inscription and now a transverse piece already prepared and fitted was lashed securely to it and it was planted on one of the little snow turrets of the summit the sign of our redemption high above north america only some peaks in the andes and some peaks in the himalayas rise above it in all the world it was of light dry birch and though six feet in length so slender that we think it may weather many a gale and walter thrust it into the snow so firmly at a blow that it could not be withdrawn again then we gathered about it and said the te deum it was one thirty p m when we reached the summit and two minutes past three when we left yet so quickly had the time flown that we could not believe we had been an hour and a half on top the journey down was a long weary grind the longer and the wearier that we made a detour and went out of our way to seek for professor parker's thermometer which he had left in a crack on the west side of the last boulder of the northeast ridge that sounds definite enough yet in fact it is equivocal which is the last boulder we disputed as we went down the slope a long series of rocks almost in line came to an end with one rock a little below the others a little out of the line this egregious boulder would it seemed to me naturally be called the last karstens thought not thought the last boulder was the last on the ridge as we learned later karstens was right and since he yielded to me we did not find the thermometer for having descended to this isolated rock we would not climb up again for fifty thermometers one's disappointment is qualified by the knowledge that the thermometer is probably not of adequate scale professor parker's recollection being that it read only to sixty degrees below zero fahrenheit a lower temperature than this is recorded every winter on the yukon river possible temperatures a thermometer reading to one hundred degrees below zero left at this spot would in my judgment perhaps yield a lower minimum than has ever yet been authentically recorded on earth and it is most unfortunate that the opportunity was lost yet i did not leave my own alcohol minimum scaled to ninety five degrees below zero and yielding by estimation perhaps ten degrees below the scaling there because of the difficulty of giving explicit directions that should lead to its ready recovery and at the close of such a day of toil as is involved in reaching the summit men have no stomach for prolonged search as will be told it is cached lower down but at a spot where it cannot be missed however for one the writer was largely unconscious of weariness in that descent all the way down my thoughts were occupied with the glorious scene my eyes had gazed upon and should gaze upon never again in all human probability i would never climb that mountain again yet if i climbed it a score more times i would never be likely to repeat such vision 
commonly only for a few hours at a time never for more than a few days at a time save in the dead of winter when climbing is out of the question does denali completely unveil himself and dismiss the clouds from all the earth beneath him not for long with these lofty colds contiguous will the vapors of cook's inlet and prince william sound and the whole north pacific ocean refrain from sweeping upward their natural trend is hitherward as the needle turns to the magnet so the clouds find an irresistible attraction in this great mountain mass and though the inner side of the range be rid of them the seaside is commonly filled to overflowing the te deum only those who have for long years cherished a great and almost inordinate desire and have had that desire gratified to the limit of their expectation can enter into the deep thankfulness and content that filled the heart upon the descent of this mountain there was no pride of conquest no trace of that exaltation of victory some enjoy upon the first ascent of a lofty peak no gloating over good fortune that had hoisted us a few hundred feet higher than others who had struggled and been discomfited rather was the feeling that a privileged communion with the high places of the earth had been granted that not only had we been permitted to lift up eager eyes to these summits secret and solitary since the world began but to enter boldly upon them to take place as it were domestically in their hitherto sealed chambers to inhabit them and to cast our eyes down from them seeing all things as they spread out from the windows of heaven itself into this strong yet serene emotion into this reverent elevation of spirit came with a shock a recollection of some recent reading oh wisdom of man and the apparatus of sciences the little columns of mercury that sling up and down the vacuum boxes that expand and contract the hammer that chips the highest rocks the compass that takes the bearings of glaciers and ridge all the equipage of hypsometry and geology and geodesy how pitifully feeble and childish it seems to cope with the majesty of the mountains take them all together haul them up the steep and as they lie there read record and done for which shall be more adequate to the whole scene their records or that simple ancient hymn we praise thee o god heaven and earth are full of the majesty of thy glory what an astonishing thing that standing where we stood and seeing what we saw there are men who should be able to deduce this law or that from their observation of its working and yet be unable to see the lawgiver who should be able to push back effect to immediate cause and yet be blind to the supreme cause of all causes who can say this is the glacier's doing and it is marvellous in our eyes and not see him who in his strength setteth fast the mountains and is girded with power whose servants the glaciers the snow and the ice are wind and storm fulfilling his word who exult in the exercise of their own intelligences and the playthings those intelligences have constructed and yet deny the omniscience that endowed them with some minute fragment of itself it was not always so it was not so with the really great men who have advanced our knowledge of nature but of late years hordes of small men had given themselves up to the study of the physical sciences without any study preliminary it would almost seem nowadays that whoever can sit in the seat of the scornful may sit in the seat of learning the scientists a good many years ago on an occasion already referred to the writer roamed through the depths of the grand canyon with a chance acquaintance who described himself as herpetologist to the academy of sciences in some western or midwestern state and as this gentleman found the curious little reptiles he was in search of under a root or in a cranny of rock he repeated their many syllabled names curious to know what these names literally meant and whence derived the writer made inquiry sometimes hazarding a conjectural etymology to his astonishment and dismay he found this scientist whom he had looked up to entirely ignorant of the meaning of the terms he employed they were just arbitrary terms to him the little hopping and crawling creatures might as well have been numbered or called x y z for any significance their formidable nomenclature held for him yet this man had been keenly sarcastic about the noachian deluge 
and had jeered from the height of his superiority at hoary records which he only knew at second-hand reference and had laid it down that if the human race became extinct the birds would stand the best chance of evolving a primate since that time other scientists have been encountered with no better equipment with no history no poetry no philosophy in any broad sense men with no letters illiterate strictly speaking yet with all the dogmatism in the world can any one be more dogmatic than your modern scientist the reproach had passed altogether to him from the theologian the thing grows and its menace and scandal grow with it since coming outside the writer has encountered a professor at a college a phd of a great university who confessed that he had never heard of certain immortal characters of dickens whose names are household words we shall have to open night schools for scientists where men who have been deprived of all early advantages may learn the rudiments of english literature one wishes that dickens himself might have dealt with their pretensions but they are since his day and surely it is time some one started a movement for suppressing illiterate phds the psalmist and dr johnson of this class one feels sure are the scientific heroes of the sensational articles in the monthly magazines of the baser sort of which we picked up a number in the cantishna on our way to the mountain here in a picture that seems to have obtruded itself bodily into a page of letterpress or else to have suffered the accidental eruption of a page of letterpress all around it you shall see a grave scientist looking anxiously down a very large microscope and shall read that he has transferred and shall read that he has transferred a kidney from a cat to a dog and therefore we can no longer believe in the immortality of the soul or else that he has succeeded in artificially fertilizing the ova of a starfish or was it a jellyfish and therefore there is no god not just in so many bald words of course but in unmistakable import or it may be so commonly does the crassus credulity go hand in hand with the blankest scepticism he has discovered the germ of old age and is hot upon the track of another germ that shall destroy it so that we may live virtually as long as we like which of course disposes once for all of a world to come the psalmist was not always complacent or even temperate in his language but he lived a long time ago and must be pardoned his curt summary stands dixit incipiens but the writer vows that if he were addicted to the pursuit of any branch of physical knowledge he would insist upon being called by the name of that branch he would be a physiologist or a biologist or an anatomist or even a herpetologist but none should call him scientist as dal tearsheet says in the second part of king henry the fourth these villains will make the word as odious as the word occupy which was an excellent good word before it was ill sorted if dr johnson were compiling an english dictionary today he would define scientist something thus a cant name for an experimenter in some department of physical knowledge commonly furnished with arrogance and dogmatism but devoid of real learning here is no jibe at the physical sciences to sneer at them were just as foolish as to sneer at religion what we could do on this expedition in a scientific way we did laboriously and zealously we would never have thought of attempting the ascent of the mountain without bringing back whatever little addition to human knowledge was within the scope of our powers and opportunities tatum took rounds of angles in practice against the good fortune of a clear day on top on every possible occasion the sole personal credit the present writer takes concerning the whole enterprise is the packing of that mercurial barometer on his back from the tanana river nearly to the top of the mountain a point at which he was compelled to relinquish it to another he had always had his opinion about mountain climbers who put an aneroid in their pocket and go to the top of a great new peak and come down confidently announcing its height but when all this business is done as closely and carefully as possible and every observation taken that there are instruments devised to record surely the soul is dead that feels no more and sees no further than the instruments do that stirs with no other emotion than the mercury in the tube or the dial at its point of suspension 
that is incapable of awe of reverence of worshipful uplift and does not feel that the lord even the most mighty god hath spoken and called the world from the rising of the sun even to the going down of the same in the wonders displayed before his eyes we reached our eighteen thousand foot camp about five o'clock a weary but happy crew it was written in the diary that night i remember no day in my life so full of toil distress and exhaustion and yet so full of happiness and keen gratification the amber glasses again the culminating day should not be allowed to pass without another tribute to the efficiency of the amber glasses notwithstanding the glare of the sun at twenty thousand feet and upward no one had the slightest irritation of the eyes there has never been an april of travel on the yukon in eight years that the writer has not suffered from inflammation of the eyes despite the darkest smoke-colored glasses that could be procured a naked candle at a roadhouse would give a stab of pain every time the eyes encountered it and reading would become almost impossible the amber glasses however while leaving vision almost as bright as without them filter out the rays that cause the irritation and afford perfect protection against the consequences of sun and glare there is only one improvement to make in the amber glasses and that is some device of air-tight cells that shall prevent them from fogging when the cold on the outside of the glass condenses the moisture of perspiration on the inside of the glass we use double glazed sashes with an air space between on all windows in our houses in alaska and find ourselves no longer incommoded by frost on the panes some adaptation of this principle should be within the skill of the optician and would remove a very troublesome defect in all snow glasses if someone would invent a preventive against shortness of breath as efficient as amber glasses are against snow blindness climbing at great altitudes would lose all its terrors for one mountaineer so far as it was possible to judge no other member of the party was near his altitude limit there seemed no reason why karstens and walter in particular should not go another ten thousand feet were there a mountain in the world ten thousand feet higher than denali but the writer knows that he himself could not have gone much higher end of chapter five Chapter Six of the Ascent of Denali by Hudson Stuck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Return. The next day was another bright, cloudless day, the second and the last of them. Perhaps never did men abandon as cheerfully stuff that had been freighted as laboriously as we abandoned our surplus baggage at the eighteen thousand foot camp we made a great pile of it in the lee of one of the ice blocks of the glacier food coal oil clothing and bedding covering all with the wolf robe and setting up a shovel as a mark though just why we cached it so carefully or for whom no one of us would be able to say it will probably be a long time ere any others camp in that grand basin while yet such a peak is unclimbed there is constant goading of mountaineering minds to its conquest once its top has been reached the incentive declines much exploring work is yet to do on denali the day will doubtless come when all its peaks and ridges and glaciers will be duly mapped but our view from the summit agreed with our study of its conformation during the ascent that no other route will be found to the top when first we were cutting and climbing on the ridge and had glimpses as the mist cleared of the glacier on the other side and the ridges that arose from it we thought that perhaps they might afford a passage but from above the appearance changed and seemed to forbid it altogether at times almost in despair at the task which the northeast ridge presented we would look across at the ice-covered rocks of the north peak and dream that they might be climbed but they are really quite impossible the south side has been tried again and again and no approach discovered nor did it appear from the top that such approach exists the west side is sheer precipice the north side is covered with a great hanging glacier and is devoid of practicable slopes it has been twice attempted only on the northeast has the glacier cut so deeply into the mountain as to give access to the heights 
june eighth was sunday but we had to take advantage of the clear bright day to get as far down the mountain as possible the stuff it was still necessary to pack made good heavy loads and we knew not what had happened to our staircase in our absence the record having said morning prayer we left at nine thirty a m after a night in which all of us slept soundly the first sound sleep some had enjoyed for a long time contentment and satisfaction are great somnificence the grand basin was glorious in sunshine the peaks crystal clear against a cloudless sky the huge blocks of ice thrown down by the earthquake and scattered all over the glacier gleamed white in the sunshine deep blue in the shadow we wound our way downward passing campsite after campsite until at the first place we camped in the grand basin we stopped for lunch then we made the traverse under the cliffs to the parker pass which we reached at one thirty p m the sun was hot there was not a breath of wind we were exceedingly thirsty and we decided to light the primus stove and make a big pot of tea and replenish the thermos bottles before attempting the descent of the ridge while this was doing a place was found to cache the minimum thermometer and a tin can that had held photographic film in which we had placed a record of our ascent above we had not found any distinctive place in which a record could be deposited with the assurance that it would be found by any one seeking it one feels sure that in the depth of winter very great cold must occur even at this elevation yet we should have liked to leave it much higher without some means which we did not possess of marking a position there would however have been little use in leaving it amid the boulders where we hunted unsuccessfully for professor parker's instrument we had hoped to be able to grave some sign upon the rocks with a geological hammer but the first time it was brought down upon the granite its point splittered in the same exasperating way that the new york dealers fancy ice axes behaved when it was attempted to put them to practical use warranted cast steel upon an implement ought to be a warning not to purchase it for mountain work tool steel alone will serve our little record cache at the parker pass placed at the foot of the west or upward facing side of the great slab which marks the natural camping site should stand there for many years it is not a place where snow lies deep or long and it will surely be found by any who seek it we took our last looks up into the grand basin still brilliant in the sunshine our last looks at the summit still cloudless and clear there was a melancholy even in the midst of triumph in looking for the last time at these scenes where we had so greatly hoped and endeavored and had been so amply rewarded we recalled the eager expectation with which we first gazed up between these granite slabs into the long hidden basin a week before and there was sadness in the feeling that in all probability we should never have this noble view again harper glacier before the reader turns his back upon the grand basin once for all i should like to put a name upon the glacier it contains since it is the fashion to name glaciers i should like to call it the harper glacier after my half-breed companion of three years who was the first human being to reach the summit of the mountain this reason might suffice but there is another and most interesting reason for associating the name harper with this mountain arthur harper walter's father the pioneer of all alaskan miners the first man who thought of trying the yukon as a mining field so far as we know as william ogilvy tells us in his early days on the yukon and none had better opportunity of knowing than ogilvy was also the first man to make written reference to this mountain since vancouver the great navigator saw it from the head of cook's inlet in 1794 arthur harper in company with al mayo made the earliest exploration of the tanana river ascending that stream in the summer of 1878 to about the present site of fairbanks and in a letter to e w nelson of the united states biological survey then on the alaskan coast harper wrote the following winter of the great ice mountain to the south as one of the most wonderful sights of the trip it is pleasant to think that a son of his yet unborn was to be the first to set foot on its top pleasantly also the office of setting his name upon the lofty glacier the gleam from which caught his eye and roused his wonder thirty years ago 
falls upon one who has been glad and proud to take in some measure his place descent then began the difficulty and the danger the toil and the anxiety of the descent of the ridge karstens led then followed tatum then the writer and then walter the unbroken surface of the ridge above the cleavage is sensationally steep and during our absence nearly two feet of new snow had fallen upon it the steps that had been shoveled as we ascended were entirely obliterated and it was necessary to shovel new ones it was the very heat of the day and by the canons of climbing we should have camped at the pass and descended in the early morning but all were eager to get down and we ventured it now that our task was accomplished our minds reverted to the boy at the base camp long anxiously expecting us and we thought of him and spoke of him continually and speculated how he had fared one feels upon reflection that we took more risk in descending that ridge than we took at any time in the ascent but karstens was most cautious and careful and in the long and intensive apprenticeship of this expedition had become most expert i sometimes wondered whether swiss guides would have had much to teach either him or walter in snowcraft their chief instruction would probably be along the line of taking more chances wisely if the writer had to ascend this mountain again he would entrust himself to karstens and walter rather than to any swiss guides he has known for ice and snow in alaska are not quite the same as ice and snow in the alps or the canadian rockies the loose snow was shoveled away and the steps dug in the hard snow beneath and the creepers upon our feet gave good grip in it thus slowly step by step we descended the ridge and in an hour and a half had reached the cleavage the most critical place in the whole descent with the least possible motion of the feet setting them exactly in the shoveled steps we crept like cats across this slope thrusting the points of our axes into the holes that had been made in the ice wall above moving all together the rope always taut no one speaking a word when once karstens was anchored on the further ice he stood and gathered up the rope as first one and then another passed safely to him and anchored himself beside him until at last we were all across then stooping to pass the overhanging ice cliff that here also disputed the pack upon one's back we went down to the long long stretch of jagged pinnacles and bergs and our intricate staircase in the masonry of them shoveling was necessary all the way down but the steps were there needing only to be uncovered passing our ridge camp passing the danger of the great gable down the rocks by which we reached the ridge and down the slopes to the glacier floor we went reaching our old camp at nine thirty p m six and a quarter hours from the parker pass twelve hours from the eighteen thousand foot camp in the grand basin our hearts full of thankfulness that the terrible ridge was behind us until we reached the glacier floor the weather had been clear almost immediately thereafter the old familiar cloud smother began to pour down from above and we saw the heights no more the glacier camp the camp was in pretty bad shape the snow that had fallen upon it had melted and frozen to ice in the sun's rays and the night frosts and weighted the tent down to the ground but an hour's work made it habitable again and we gleefully piled the stove with the last of our wood and used the last spoonfuls of a can of baking powder to make a batch of biscuits the first bread we had eaten in two weeks next day we abandoned the camp leaving all standing and putting our packs upon a yukon sled rejecting the ice creepers and resuming our rough lock snowshoes we started down the glacier in soft cloudy weather to our base camp again it had been wiser to have waited till night that the snow bridges over the crevasses might be at their hardest but we could not wait every mind was occupied with johnny we were two weeks overstayed of the time we had told him to expect our return and we knew not what might have happened to the boy the four of us on one rope karstens leading and walter at the gee pole we went down the first sharp descents of the glaciers without much trouble the new soft snow making a good break for the sled but lower down the crevasses began to give us trouble the snow bridges were melted at their edges 
and sometimes the sled had to be lowered down to the portion that still held and hauled up at the other side sometimes a bridge gave way at its edge was cautiously ventured upon with the snowshoes and we had to go far over to the glacier wall to get round the crevasse the willows with which we had staked the trail still stood sometimes just their tips appearing above the new snow and they were a good guide though we often had to leave the old trail at last the crevasses were all passed and we reached the lower portion of the glacier which is free of them then the snow grew softer and softer and our moccasined feet were soon wet through large patches of the black shale with which much of this glacier is covered were quite bare of snow and the sled had to be hauled laboriously across them then we began to encounter pools of water which at first we avoided but they soon grew so numerous that we went right through them flowers the going grew steadily wetter and rougher and more disagreeable the lower stretch of a glacier is an unhandsome sight in summer all sorts of rock debris and ugly black shale with discolored melting ice and snow intersected everywhere with streams of dirty water this was what it had degenerated into as we reached the pass the snow was entirely gone from the pass so the sled was abandoned left standing upright with its gee pole sticking in the air that if anyone else ever chanced to want it it might readily be found the snowshoes were piled around it and we resumed our packs and climbed up to the pass the first thing that struck our eyes as we stood upon the rocks of the pass was a brilliant trailing purple moss flower of such gorgeous color that we all exclaimed at its beauty and wondered how it grew clinging to bare rock it was the first bright color that we had seen for so long that it gave unqualified pleasure to us all and was a foretaste of the enhancing delights that awaited us as we descended to the bespangled valley if a man would know to the utmost the charm of flowers let him exile himself among the snows of a lofty mountain during the fifty days of spring and come down into the first full flush of summer we could scarcely pass a flower by and presently had our hands full of blooms like schoolgirls on a picnic but although the first things that attracted our attention were the flowers the next were the mosquitoes they were waiting for us at the pass and they gave us their warmest welcome the writer took sharp blame to himself that organizing and equipping this expedition he had made no provision against these intolerable pests but we had so confidently expected to come out a month earlier before the time of mosquitoes arrived that although the matter was suggested and discussed it was put aside as unnecessary now there was the prospect of a fifty or sixty mile tramp across country subject all the while to the assaults of venomous insects which are a greater hindrance to summer travel in alaska than any extremity of cold is to winter travel not even the mosquitoes however took our minds from johnny and a load was lifted from every heart when we came near enough to our camp to see that someone was moving about it a shout brought him running and he never stopped until he had met us and had taken the pack from my shoulders and put it on his own our happiness was now unalloyed the last anxiety was removed the dogs gave us most jubilant welcome and were fat and well favored johnny and the sugar what a change had come over the place all the snow was gone from the hills the stream that gathered its three forks at this point roared over its rocks the stunted willows were in full leaf the thick soft moss of every dark shade of green and yellow and red made a foil for innumerable brilliant flowers the fat gray conies chirped at us from the rocks the ground squirrels greatly multiplied since the wholesale destruction of foxes kept the dogs unavailingly chasing hither and thither whenever they were loose we never grew tired of walking up and down and to and fro about the camp it was a delight to tread upon the moss-covered earth after so long treading upon nothing but ice and snow it was a delight to gaze out through naked eyes after all those weeks in which we had dared not even for a few moments to lay aside the yellow glasses in the open air it was a delight to see joyful eager animal life around us after our sojourn in regions dead supper was a delight johnny had killed four mountain sheep and a caribou while we were gone 
and not only had fed the dogs well but from time to time had put aside choice portions expecting our return but what was most grateful to us and most extraordinary in him the boy had saved untouched the small ration of sugar and milk left for his consumption knowing that ours was all destroyed and we enjoyed coffee with these luxurious appurtenances as only they can who have been long deprived of them there are not many boys of fifteen or sixteen of any race who would voluntarily have done the like the next day there was much to do there were pack saddles of canvas to make for the dogs backs that they might help us carry our necessary stuff out our own clothing and footwear to overhaul bread to bake guns to clean and oil against rust yet withal we took it lazily with five to divide these tasks and napped and lay around and continually consumed biscuits and coffee which johnny continually cooked we all took at least a partial bath in the creek cold as it was the first bath in well in a long time mountain climbers belong legitimately to the great unwashed it was a day of perfect rest and contentment with hearts full of gratitude not a single mishap had occurred to mar the complete success of our undertaking not an injury of any sort to any one nor an illness all five of us were in perfect health surely we had reason to be grateful and surely we were happy in having him to whom our gratitude might be poured out what a bald incomplete and disconcerting thing it must be to have no one to thank for crowning mercies like these on tuesday the tenth june we made our final abandonment leaving the tent standing with stove and food and many articles that we did not need cached in it and with four of the dogs carrying packs and led with chains packs on our own backs and the ice axes for staves in our hands we turned our backs upon the mountain and went down the valley toward the clear water the going was not too bad until we had crossed that stream and climbed the hills to the rolling country between it and the mckinley fork of the kantishna again and again we looked back for a parting glimpse of the mountain but we never saw sign of it any more the foothills were clear the rugged wall of the glacier cut the sky but the great mountain might have been a thousand miles off for any visible indication it gave it is easy to understand how travelers across equatorial africa have passed near the base of the snowy peaks of the ruanzori without knowing they were even in the neighborhood of great mountains and have come back and denied their existence across country the broken country between the streams was difficult underneath was a thick elastic moss in which the foot sank three or four inches at every step and that makes toilsome traveling the mosquitoes were a constant annoyance but the abundant bird life upon this open moorland continually reminding one as it did of moorlands in the north of england or of scotland was full of interest ptarmigan half changed from their snowy plumage to the brown of summer and presenting a curious piebald appearance were there in great numbers cackling their guttural cry with its concluding notes closely resembling the coax coax of the frogs chorus in the comedy of aristophanes snipe whistled and curlews whirled all about us halfway across to the mckinley fork it began to rain thunder peal succeeding thunder peal and each crash announcing a heavier downpour soon we were all wet through and then the rain turned to hail that fell smartly until all the moss was white with it and that gave place to torrents of rain again dog packs and men's packs were alike wet and no one of us had a dry stitch on him when we reached the banks of the mckinley fork and the old spacious hunting tent that stands there in which we were to spend the night rather hopelessly we hung our bedding to dry on ropes strung about some trees and our wet clothing around the stove by taking turns all night in sitting up to keep a fire going we managed to get our clothes dried by morning but the bedding was wet as ever fortunately the night was a warm one glacial streams the next morning there was the mckinley fork to cross the first thing and it was a difficult and disagreeable task this stream which drains the muldrow glacier and therefore the whole northeast face of denali 
occupies a dreary desolate bed of boulder and gravel and mud a mile or more wide rather it does not occupy it save perhaps after tremendous rain following great heat but wanders amid it with a dozen channels of varying depth but uniform blackness the inky solution of the shale which the mountain discharges so abundantly tinging not only its waters but the whole cantishna into which it flows one hundred miles away commonly in the early morning the waters are low the night frosts checking the melting of the glacier ice but this morning the drainage of yesterday's rainstorm had swollen them channel after channel was waded in safety until the main stream was reached and that swept by thigh deep with a rushing black current that had a very evil look Carstens was scouting ahead feeling for the shallower places stemming the hurrying waters till they swept up to his waist the dogs did not like the look of it and with their packs still wet from yesterday were hampered in swimming two that tatum was leading suddenly turned back when halfway across and the chains entangling his legs pulled him over face foremost into the deepest of the water his pack impeded his efforts to rise and the water swept all over him Carstens hurried back to his rescue and he was extricated from his predicament half drowned and his clothes filled with mud and sand there was no real danger of drowning but it was a particularly noxious ducking in icy filth the sun was warm however and after basking upon the rocks a while he was able to proceed still wet though he had stripped and wrung out his clothes for we had no dry change and very gritty in underwear but taking no harm whatever i think tatum regretted losing in the mad rush of black water the ice axe he had carried to the top of the mountain more than he regretted his wedding birds and beasts on the further bank of the mckinley fork we entered our first wood a belt about three miles wide that lines the river our first forest trees gave us almost as much pleasure as our first flowers animal life abounded all in the especially interesting condition of rearing half-grown young squirrels from their nests scolded at our intrusion most vehemently an owl flew up with such a noisy snapping and chattering that our attention was drawn to the point from which she rose and there perched upon a couple of rotten stumps a few feet apart were two half-fledged owlets passive immovable which allowed themselves to be photographed and even handled without any indication of life except in their wondering eyes and the circumrotary heads that contained them moose signs and bear signs were everywhere rabbits now in their summer livery flitted from bush to bush that belt of wood was a zoological garden stocked with birds and mammals and we rejoiced with them over their promising families and harmed none from the wood we rose again to the moorland to the snipe and ptarmigan and curlews some yet sitting upon belated eggs to the heavy going of the moss and the yet heavier going of the niggerhead our journey skirted a large lake picturesquely surrounded by hills and we spoke of how pleasantly a summer lodge might be placed upon its shores were it not for the mosquitoes the incessant leaping of fish the occasional flight of fowl alone disturbed the perfect reflection of cliff and hill in its waters at times we followed game trails along its margin at times swampy ground made us seek the hillside thus slowly covering the miles that we had gone so quickly over upon the ice of the lake two months before we reached moose creek and the miners cabins at eureka late at night and received warm welcome and most hospitable entertainment from mr jack hamilton it was good to see men other than our own party again good to sleep in a bed once more good to regale ourselves with food long strange to our mouths here we had our first intimation of any happenings in the outside world for the past three months and sorrowed that saint sophia was still to remain a mohammedan temple and that the kindly king of greece had been murdered here also hamilton generously provided us with spare mosquito netting for veils and we found a package of canvas gloves i had ordered from fairbanks long before and so were protected from our chief enemies from moose creek we went over the hills to caribou creek and again were most kindly welcomed and entertained by mr and mrs quigley and discussed our climb for a long while with mcgonagall of the pioneer party 
then mainly down the bed of glacier creek now on lingering ice or snowdrift with the water rushing underneath now on the rocks now through the brush crossing and recrossing the creek we reached the long line of desolate decaying houses known as glacier city and found convenient refuge in one of the cabins therein still maintained as an occasional abode on the outskirts of the city next morning a moose and two calves sprang up from the brush our approach over the moss not giving enough notice to awake her from sleep until we were almost upon her the boat instead of pursuing our way across the increasingly difficult and swampy country to the place where our boat and supplies lay cached we turned aside at midday to the fish camp on the bear paw and after enjoying the best our host possessed from the stream and from his early garden borrowed his boat choosing twenty miles or so on the water to nine of niggerhead and marsh but the river was very low and we had much trouble getting the boat over the riffles and bars so that it was late at night when we reached that other habitation of dragons known as diamond city while we submerged our cached poling boat to swell its sun-dried seams walter and johnny returned the borrowed boat and since the stream had fallen yet more were many hours in reaching the fish camp and in tramping back the beaver and the indians but the labor of the return journey was now done a canvas stretched over willows made a shelter for the centre of the boat and at noon on the second day men dogs and baggage were embarked to float down the bear paw to the kantishna to the tanana to the yukon the bear paw swarmed with animal life geese and ducks with their little terrified broods scooted ahead of us on the water the mothers presently leaving their young in a nook of the bank and making a flying detour to return to them sometimes a duck would simulate a broken wing to lure us away from the little ones we had no meat and were hungry for the usual early summer diet of waterfowl but not hungry enough to kill these birds beaver dropped noisily into the water from trees that exhibited their marvelous carpentry some lying prostrate some half chiseled through it seemed indeed as though the beaver were preparing great irrigation works all through this country since the law went into effect prohibiting their capture until nineteen fifteen they have increased and multiplied all over interior alaska they are still caught by the natives but since their skins cannot be sold the indians are wearing beaver garments again to the great advantage of health in the severe winters one wishes very heartily that the prohibition might be made perpetual for only so will fur become the native wear again it is good to see the children particularly in beaver coats and breeches instead of the wretched cotton that otherwise is almost their only garb would it be altogether beyond reason to hope that a measure which was enacted to prevent the extermination of an animal might be perpetuated on behalf of the survival of an interesting and deserving race of human beings now sorely threatened or is it solely the conservation of commercial resources that engages the attention of the government there are few measures that would redound more to the physical benefit of the alaskan indian than the perpetuating of the law against the sale of beaver skins with the present high and continually appreciating price of skins none of the common people of the land white or native can afford to wear furs such a prohibition as has been suggested would restore to alaskans a small share in the resources of alaska is there any country in the world where furs are actually needed more not only beaver but nearly all fur and game animals have greatly increased in the kantishna country in the year of the stampede when thousands of men spent the winter here there was wholesale destruction of game and trapping of fur but the country left to itself is now restocked of game and fur except of foxes the high price of which has almost exterminated them here and is rapidly exterminating them throughout interior alaska they have been poisoned in the most reckless and unscrupulous way and there seems no means of stopping it under the present law we saw scarcely a fox track in the country though a few years ago they were exceedingly plentiful all over the foothills of the great range mink marten and muskrat were seen from time to time swimming in the river a couple of yearling moose started from the bank where they had been drinking as we noiselessly turned a bend 
brilliant kingfishers flitted across the water so down these rivers we drifted sometimes in sunshine sometimes in rain until early in the morning of the twentieth june we reached tanana and our journey was concluded three months and four days after it was begun when the telegraph office opened at eight o'clock a message was sent in accordance with promise to a seattle paper and it illustrates the rapidity with which news is spread to-day that a ship in the bering sea approaching nome received the news from seattle by wireless telegraph before eleven a m but a message from the seattle paper received the same morning asking for five hundred more words describing narrow escapes was left unanswered for thank god there were none to describe end of chapter six Chapter Seven of the Ascent of Denali by Hudson Stuck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. The height of Denali, with a discussion of the readings on the summit and during the ascent. The determination of the heights of mountains by triangulation is, of course, the method that, in general, commends itself to the topographer though it may be questioned whether the very general use of aneroids for barometric determinations has not thrown this latter means of measuring altitudes into undeserved discredit when the mercurial barometer is used instead of its convenient but unreliable substitute the altitude given on present maps for denali is the mean of determinations made by triangulation by three different men muldrow on the shushetna side in 1898 rayburn on the kuskokwim side in nineteen o two and porter from the yentna country in nineteen o six in addition a determination was made by the coast and geodetic survey in nineteen ten from points near cook's inlet the work of the coast survey writes mr alfred brooks is more refined than the rough triangulation done by our men at the same time they were much further away it is a curious coincidence he adds that the determination made by the coast survey was the mean which we had assumed from our three determinations twenty thousand three hundred feet theodolites and barometers there are however two sources of air in the determination of the height of this mountain by triangulation a general one and a particular one the general one lies in the difficulty of ascertaining the proper correction to be applied for the refraction of the atmosphere and the higher the mountain the greater the liability to this air for not much is positively known about the angle of refraction of the upper regions of the air the officers of the trigonometrical survey of india have published their opinion that the heights of the great peaks of the himalayas will have to be revised on this account the report of the Coast Survey's determination of the height of Denali claims a coefficient of refraction nearer the truth than the figure used on a previous occasion, but a very slight difference in this factor will make a considerable difference in the result. The particular source of air in the case of this mountain lies in the circumstance that its summit is flat and there is no culminating point upon which the crosshairs of the surveying instrument may intersect the barometric determination of heights is of course not without similar troubles of its own the tables of altitudes corresponding to pressures do not agree Airy's table giving relatively greater altitudes for very low pressures than the smithsonian all such tables as originally calculated are based upon the hypothesis of a temperature and humidity which decrease regularly with the altitude and this is not always the case nor is the static equilibrium of the atmosphere which laplace assumed always maintained that is to say an equal difference of pressure does not always correspond to an equal difference of altitude there is in point of fact no absolute way to determine altitude save by running an actual line of levels all other methods are approximations at best but there had never been a barometric determination of the height of this mountain made and it was resolved to attempt it on this expedition to this end careful arrangements were made and much labor and trouble undergone the author carried his standard mercurial mountain barometer to fort gibbon on the yukon in september nineteen twelve 
and compared it with the instrument belonging to the signal corps of the united states army at that post a very close agreement was found in the two instruments the reading of the one by himself and of the other by the sergeant whose regular duty it was to read and record the instrument being identical to two places of decimals at the same temperature readings on the summit arrangements were made with captain mickel of the signal corps at fort gibbon when the expedition started to the mountain in march nineteen thirteen to read the barometer at that post three times a day and record the reading with the reading of the attached thermometer acknowledgment is here made of captain mickel's courtesy and kindness in this essential cooperation the reading at fort gibbon which most nearly synchronizes with the reading on top of the mountain is the one taken at noon on the seventh june the reading on top of the mountain was made at about one fifty p m so that there was an hour and fifty minutes difference in time the weather however was set fair without a cloud in the sky and had been for more than twelve hours before and remained so for thirty-six hours afterward it would seem therefore that the difference in time is negligible the reading at fort gibbon a place of an altitude of three hundred and thirty-four feet above sea level at noon on the seventh june was twenty nine point five nine zero inches with an attached thermometer reading seventy six point five degrees fahrenheit the reading on the summit of denali at one fifty p m on the same day was thirteen point six one seven the writer is greatly chagrined that he cannot give with the same confidence the reading of the attached thermometer on top of the mountain but desires to set forth the circumstances and give the readings in his notebook records the notebook gives the air temperature on the summit as seven degrees fahrenheit taken by a standard alcohol minimum thermometer and it remained constant during the hour and a half we were there the sun was shining but a bitter north wind was blowing but the reading of the thermometer attached to the barometer is recorded as twenty degrees fahrenheit i am unable to account for this discrepancy of thirteen degrees the mercurial barometer was swung on its tripod inside the instrument tent we had carried to the summit a rough zero was established and it was left for twenty minutes or so to adjust itself to conditions before an exact reading was taken it was my custom throughout the ascent to read and record the thermometer immediately after the barometer was read but it is almost certain that on this momentous occasion it was not done possibly the thermometer was read immediately the instrument was taken out of its leather case and its wooden case and set up while it yet retained some of the animal heat of the back that had borne it and the reading was written in the prepared place then when the barometer was finally read no temperature of the attached thermometer was noted this is the only possible explanation that occurs and it is very unsatisfactory it was not until we were down at the base camp again that i looked at the figures and discovered their difference and i could not then recall in detail the precise operations on the summit it is hard to understand ordinarily how any man could have recorded the two readings on the same page of the book without noticing their discrepancy but perhaps the excitement and difficulty of the situation combine to produce what sir martin conway calls high altitude stupidity in exculpation it is indeed impossible to convey to the reader who has never found himself circumstanced as we were an understanding of our perturbation of mind and body upon reaching the summit of the mountain breathless with excitement and with the altitude hearts afire and feet nigh frozen what should be done on top what first what next had been carefully planned and even rehearsed but we were none of us schooled in stoical self-repression to command our emotions completely here was the crown of nearly three months toil and of all those long years of desire and expectation it was hard to gather one's wits and resolutely address them to prearranged tasks hard to secure a sufficient detachment of mind for careful and accurate observations the sudden outspreading of the great mass of denali's wife immediately below us and in front of us was of itself a surprise that was dramatic and disconcerting a splendid vision from which it was difficult to withdraw the eyes we knew of course the companion peak was there but had forgotten all about her 
having had no slightest glimpse of her on the whole ascent until at the one stroke she stood completely revealed not more dazzling to the eyes of the pasha in the picture was the form of the lovely woman when the slave throws off the draperies that veiled her from head to foot moreover problems that had been discussed and disputed questions about the conformation of the mountain and the possibilities of approach to it were now soluble at a glance and clamoured for solution we held them back and fell at once to our scientific work denying any gratification of sight until these tasks were performed yet it is plain that i at least was not proof against the disturbing consciousness of the wonders that waited it was bitterly cold yet my fingers though numb were usable when i reached the top it was in exposing them to manipulate the hypsometrical instruments that they lost all feeling and came nigh freezing and breathlessness was naturally at its worst i remember that even the exertion of rising from the prone position it was necessary to assume to read the barometer brought on a fit of panting calculations for altitude with these circumstances in mind we will resume the discussion of the readings taken on the summit and their bearing upon the altitude of the mountain it seems right to disregard the temperature recorded for the attached thermometer and to use the air temperature of which there is no doubt in correcting the barometric reading so they stand barometer thirteen point six one seven inches temperature seven degrees fahrenheit the boiling point thermometer stood at one hundred seventy four point nine degrees fahrenheit when the steam was pouring out of the vent they stand therefore gibbon three hundred thirty four feet altitude barometer twenty nine point five nine zero thermometer seventy six point five degrees fahrenheit the summit of denali barometer thirteen point six one seven thermometer seven degrees fahrenheit now the tables accessible to the writer do not work out their calculations beyond eighteen thousand feet and he confesses himself too long unused to mathematical labors of any kind for the task of extending them he was therefore constrained to fall back upon the kindness of mr alfred brooks the head of the alaskan division of the united states geological survey and mr brooks turned over the data to mr c e giffen topographic engineer of that service to which gentleman thankful acknowledgment is made for the result that follows ignoring a calculation based upon a temperature of twenty degrees fahrenheit on the summit and another based upon a temperature of thirteen point five degrees fahrenheit on the summit the mean of the air temperature and that recorded for the attached thermometer and confining attention to the calculation which takes the air temperature of seven degrees fahrenheit as the proper figure for the correction of the barometer a result is reached which shows the summit of denali as twenty one thousand and eight feet above the sea it should be added that mr giffen obtained from the united states weather bureau the barometric and thermometric readings taken at valdez on seventh june about the same length of time after our reading on the summit as the reading at gibbon was before ours from these readings mr giffen makes the altitude of the mountain twenty thousand three hundred and seventy four feet above valdez which is ten feet above sea level from this result mr giffen is disposed to question the accuracy of the reading at gibbon though the author has no reason to doubt it was properly and carefully made valdez is much farther from the summit than fort gibbon and is in a different climatic zone the calculation from the valdez base should however be taken into consideration in making this barometric determination and the mean of the two results twenty thousand six hundred and ninety six feet or roundly twenty thousand seven hundred feet is offered as the contribution of this expedition toward determining the true altitude of the mountain the figures of mr giffen's calculations touching the altitude of this mountain and also determining the altitudes of various salient points or stages of the ascent of the mountain are printed below denali mount mckinley using air thermometer reading plus seven degrees and the reading at fort gibbon for the same date mount mckinley barometric reading thirteen point six one seven inches barometer reduced to standard temperature 
plus point zero two seven inches temperature seven degrees thirteen point six four four inches fort gibbon barometric reading twenty nine point five nine zero inches barometer reduced to standard temperature minus point one two eight inches temperature seventy six point five degrees twenty nine point four six two inches mount mckinley corrected barometer thirteen point six four four inches twenty one thousand three hundred twenty four feet fort gibbon corrected the barometer twenty nine point four six two inches four hundred feet twenty thousand nine hundred twenty four feet mean temperature forty one point seven degrees approximate difference in elevation twenty thousand nine hundred twenty four feet minus three hundred fifty six feet latitude sixty four degrees approximate difference in elevation twenty thousand five hundred sixty eight feet plus fifteen feet mean temperature forty one point seven degrees approximate difference in elevation twenty thousand five hundred sixty eight feet plus seventy one feet elevation lowest four hundred approximate difference in elevation twenty thousand five hundred sixty eight feet plus twenty feet elevation above fort gibbon twenty thousand six hundred seventy four feet elevation of fort gibbon three hundred thirty four feet elevation above sea twenty one thousand eight feet using the thermometric reading of seven degrees at mount mckinley and the u s weather bureau reading at valdez for same date mount mckinley barometric reading one three point six one seven inches barometer reduced to standard temperature plus point zero two seven inches temperature seven degrees thirteen point six four four inches valdez barometric reading twenty nine point seven six inches barometer reduced to standard temperature point zero six eight inches twenty nine point six nine two inches temperature fifty four degrees mount mckinley corrected barometric reading thirteen point six four four inches twenty one thousand three hundred twenty four feet valdez corrected barometric reading twenty nine point six nine two inches one hundred ninety feet twenty one thousand one hundred thirty four feet mean temperature thirty point five degrees approximate difference in elevation twenty one thousand one hundred thirty four feet minus eight hundred and forty feet latitude sixty two degrees approximate difference in elevation twenty thousand two hundred ninety five feet plus eighteen feet mean temperature thirty point five degrees approximate difference in elevation twenty thousand two hundred ninety five feet plus forty two feet elevation lowest one hundred ninety approximate difference in elevation twenty thousand two hundred ninety five feet plus twenty feet elevation above valdez twenty thousand three hundred seventy four feet elevation of valdez ten feet elevation above sea twenty thousand three hundred eighty four feet altitudes of camping stations first glacier camp glacier camp barometric reading twenty two point five five four inches temperature eighty one degrees barometer reduced to standard temperature minus point one zero six inches twenty two point four four eight inches fort gibbon barometric reading twenty nine point one one zero inches temperature seventy four degrees barometer reduced to standard temperature minus point one two zero inches twenty eight point nine nine zero inches glacier camp corrected barometer twenty two point four four eight inches seven thousand seven hundred ninety one feet 
Fort Gibbon corrected barometer, 28.990 inches, 840 feet, 6,951 feet. Mean temperature, 77.5 degrees. Approximate difference in elevation, 6,951 feet, plus 393 feet. Latitude, 64 degrees. Approximate difference in elevation, 7,343 feet, plus 5 feet. Mean temperature, 77.5 degrees. Approximate difference in elevation, 7,343 feet, plus 74 feet. Elevation lowest, 840. Approximate difference in elevation, 7,343 feet, plus 3 feet. Elevation above Fort Gibbon, 7,426 feet. Elevation of Fort Gibbon, 334 feet. Elevation above sea, 7,760 feet. Head of Muldrow Glacier. Muldrow Glacier, barometric reading, 19.640 inches. Temperature, 36 degrees. Barometer reduced to standard temperature, minus 0 0.013 inches, 19.627 inches. Fort Gibbon barometric reading, 30.065 inches. Temperature, 71 degrees. Barometer reduced to standard temperature, minus 0 0.115 inches, 29.950 inches. Muldrow Glacier, corrected barometer, 19.627 inches, 11,441 feet. Fort Gibbon, corrected barometer, 29.950 inches, minus 45 feet, 11,486 feet. Temperature, 53.5 degrees. Approximate difference in elevation, 11,486 feet, plus 79 feet. Latitude, 65 degrees. Approximate difference in elevation, 11,565 feet, plus 8 feet. Mean temperature, 53.5 degrees. Approximate difference in elevation, 11,565 feet, plus 63 feet. Elevation lowest, 45. Approximate difference in elevation, 11,565 feet, plus 6 feet. Elevation above Fort Gibbon, 11,642 feet. Elevation of Fort Gibbon, 334 feet. Elevation above sea, 11,976 feet. Parker Pass. Parker Pass barometric reading, 17.330 inches. Temperature, 43 degrees. Barometer reduced to standard temperature, minus 0 0.023 inches. 17.307 inches. Fort Gibbon barometric reading, 30.050 inches. Temperature, 69.5 degrees. Barometer reduced to standard temperature, minus 0 0.111 inches. 29.939 inches. Parker Pass corrected barometer, 17.307 inches. 14,861 feet. Fort Gibbon, corrected barometer, 29.939 inches, minus 35 feet, 14,896 feet. Mean temperature, 56.25 degrees. Approximate difference in elevation, 14,896 feet, plus 185 feet. Latitude, 64 degrees. Approximate difference in elevation, 
15,091 feet, plus 11 feet. At temperature of 56.25 degrees, approximate difference in elevation, 15,091 feet, plus 92 feet. Elevation lowest, minus 35 degrees, approximate difference in elevation, 15,091 feet, plus 11 feet. Elevation above Fort Gibbon, 15,195 feet. Elevation of Fort Gibbon, 334 feet. Elevation above sea, 15,529 feet. Last Camp Last Camp Barometric Reading 15.220 inches Temperature 40 degrees Barometer reduced to standard temperature minus 0 0.016 inches 15.204 inches Fort Gibbon Barometric Reading 29.660 inches Barometer reduced to standard temperature, minus 0 0.120 inches. Temperature, 73.5 degrees, 29.540 inches. Last camp corrected barometer, 15.204 inches, 18,382 feet. Fort Gibbon corrected barometer, 29.540 inches, 329 feet, 18,053 feet. Mean temperature, 56.75 degrees. Approximate difference in elevation, 18,053 feet, plus 248 feet. Latitude, 64 degrees. Approximate difference in elevation, 18,301 feet, plus 17 feet. Mean temperature, 56.75 degrees. Approximate difference in elevation, 18,301 feet, plus 112 feet. Elevation lowest, 329. Approximate difference in elevation, 18,000 301 feet plus 16 feet. Elevation above Fort Gibbon, 18,446 feet. Elevation of Fort Gibbon, 334 feet. Elevation above sea, 18,780 feet. End of chapter 7. Chapter 8 of The Ascent of Denali by Hudson Stuck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. Explorations of the Denali region and previous.